Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto trained by summons for Chunin exams. Before I start, please support for more amazing content and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written by Free Drinks and link in the description and support writer. Let's start the video. Under clap. The idea hit Jiraiya like a bolt of lightning, but the entire shinobi world feet the thunder clap. I don't own Naruto. I don't make money from this. I do this for fun. I hope you enjoy. Dodes. A small creature that had just appeared in a cloud of smoke gave what counted as a proud ribbit. Behind the amphibian, Jiraiya beamed. Pretty sweet, huh? The boy's brow furrowed, his gaze darting between the tiny creature and its summoner in a mixture of focus and confusion. Jiraiya didn't seem to mind the pause. It was important to let the audience soak in the art, after all. Eventually, when clarity finally breached through their consciousness, they would follow their heart and shout out their praises like. That's it. Jiraiya blinked. Were he a lesser man, such criticism could have cast a dark pall over his features. But he was Jiraiya of the Sanin. Renowned Toad Sage, High Priest of Mount Mayaboku, Defender of Fair Maiden from High No Kuni to the Deserts of Suna. He would not be so easily derailed by the gripes of a lone critic. Greatness, as he had learned over many decades of adventures, was rarely appreciated by the common rabble. Sometimes, you had to sell it. That's it. The Toad Sage boomed, that's it. Kid, kid, kid. Summoning Jutsu are some of the rarest, most powerful Jutsu around. A contract with a summoning animal is something Chunin and Jounin would kill for the opportunity to obtain. And to have a contract with the legendary Toad clans of Mount Mayaboku. Worth its weight in gold and then all the jewels in at the Amyu's court. Shinobi nations have gone to war over much lesser contracts. The boy's eyes widened slightly, and Jiraiya smirked. His words were breaking through whatever wall of ignorance had blockaded the boy's skull. The next words out of his mouth were surely bound to be amazement and one dot. I mean the boy said slowly, squinting as he examined the animal more closely. What can they do? For the briefest of moments, Jiraiya scowled. In a poof, the toad disappeared and Jiraiya stepped in through the smoke, laughing lively and hoisting his arms out wide. What can they do? He bellowed, sharing an incredulous look with the invisible audience surrounding them. Kid, the toad clan are the most dynamic fighters in the shinobi world. Fighting, brawling, espionage, drinking. You name it, and these toads can handle it. The boy tilted his head slightly with a distant look. Will it help me fight Niji? Inwardly, Jiraiya groaned. Leave it to a genin to be given the key to a mansion, only to ask where the bathroom was. Niji? Brat, if you were up against a whole legion of enemy ninja, there's not a single technique in the world that would serve you better than Kuchiya's no jutsu. Hook. Line. Sinker. Jiraiya patted himself on the back for his showmanship. The kid had been much more difficult than he'd anticipated, but the Legion line was inspired, if he did say so himself. He could already see the small sparkle glinting in the boy's eye. Visions of a lone, blonde shinobi standing before an approaching enemy army, a Hokage's cloak billowing dramatically in the winds of war. Despite uncountable odds, in the flash of hand signs, a matching army of massive toads descended on the battlefield, cutting clear through the enemy ranks. It would take a few details, of course, but Jiraiya could vividly remember having the same daydream when first offered the scroll. The boy opened his mouth, and Jiraiya closed his eyes with a smirk, calmly awaiting whatever jubilant enthusiasm was sure to come. They the boy stammered, suddenly looking down and shifting nervously. I don't know. Jiraiya blinked again. You he said slowly, as if unsure what the boy had even responded, don't know. At the confusion in the sage's voice, the blonde suddenly jolted up straight, his face awash in embarrassment as frantically waving his hands in apology. No, no. He stammered, uncharacteristically apologetic, I mean, this jutsu sounds freaking awesome. And you didn't have to offer to teach it to me, and it's really, really awesome that you did, and I'm very grateful, but. Jiraiya leveled a small glare, tilting his head back slightly. I'm offering you a summoning scroll. Once in a lifetime here, brat. How is there a but? He could literally hear the rust on gears as they churned desperately in the boy's mind. Well the genin nervously offered. Well, you said it could take out whole bunches of enemy ninja, but you didn't say how it fights against just one enemy. Jiraiya's glare relaxed, but he raised an eyebrow. Like, what do you even do if you just want to take out one guy? The blonde continued, staring intently into his hands so as to not have to look at the white-haired man. Just summon some huge frog and make it fall on them. Jiraiya's immediate reflex was designed to respond on two points. One, just to reiterate and make sure the boy was aware while offering enough sarcasm to adequately convey that it was absolutely ridiculous for a genin to be turning down a summoning contract. Seriously. Ridiculous. He'd heard the kid was a little thick but sheesh. And, two, of course, to explain that summoning a toad on top of someone was completely an acceptable plan of Ada. 
Duraya paused. Wasn't it? Duraya had summoned toads on plenty of his enemies. It was easily one of his favorite uses for his amphibious warriors. That said, the more he thought on the boy's question, the more he began to doubt the effectiveness of squishing your enemies beneath a mountain of summons. Gravity was a deadly weapon, but such skills took more spatial awareness and timing than he was sure the boy was capable of. Duraya recalled more than one small residence that had accidentally become the victim of such a move in his earlier years. What's more, however, Duraya was forced to re-examine the effectiveness of a summon in one versus one situations. While many of the larger toads were far more suited for mass fighting scenarios, there were plenty of smaller, more specialized members of the clan that could easily be of assistance in close quarters combat. That effectiveness, however, was entirely dependent on having a mutual bond of respect and trust with the toad. Effective combat with one of the smaller toads took coordination built up over hundreds of hours of joint training and at least a dozen broken bones. Aka, longer than the month the boy had. The blonde, nervously shooting glances at the pensive look that had fallen over his new teacher's face, felt a new wave of guilt wash over him. I'm sorry. He blurted, kicking himself for his own stubbornness. I don't mean to turn down your offer, it's really very kind of you, mister. It's just. Naruto. The boy immediately fell silent, nervously looking up to meet Jurea's face. Stop apologizing. He said, more softly this time as he examined how upset the young boy had become worrying about being ungrateful. Slowly, Jurei wandered over to the bank of a nearby stream and sat by its waters, motioning for the boy to follow him. I'm not mad. Naruto's head whipped around, hesitation now mixed with the smallest sliver of hope. You're not. Jurei shook his head, leaning back on his hands and giving a small laugh. No. I'm not. You're still an idiot for not taking me up on my offer, but well. I'm not sure your reasoning is off. Naruto looked like he had something to say in response to that, but seemed to shake his head before turning his gaze back to the stream. However, Jurea continued, in my great, sage-like wisdom, I'm wondering what the hell has caused such a drastic switch to logic from the entirety of your other behavior today. At that, Naruto at least had the decency to look slightly ashamed. Ah, he replied nervously, well. You just were describing the technique really dramatically, and it suddenly started to sound like how Kakashi-sensei described that closet pervert Ibisu he tried to pawn me off to. The blonde trailed off, but Jiraiya's features hardened, and the sanin was suddenly filled with the urge to summon a toad on a certain jounin. Not a big one, really. Definitely a medium to heavy-sized one, though. Pawned you off, did he? Yeah, the boy said with a sigh, his head slumping uncharacteristically. I mean, I get that he's gotta teach that bastard something to fight the sand freak. Some wild and crazy jutsu, or whatever, but I've been thinking about it more all day, and I guess it just sort of got to me. Hold on, Jiraiya interrupted in confusion bastard. You mean the Achiha kid? Naruto nodded solemnly, a small sneer crossing his lips. Yeah. His stupid Sharingan means he can learn whatever super awesome technique Kakashi-sensei is gonna teach him instantly. And Niji's got that crazy eye to jutsu that he gets from his family, and it's just. Naruto trailed off, but a deep frown had already settled across Jiraiya's face as the sun set in the distance. I just feel like everyone's just had all these cool moves and secret techniques just given to them growing up, and I'm just left picking up the scraps or stealing something. Naruto, having seemingly voiced the weighing angst in his body, leaned back on the river, resting his hands behind his head and stared up at the sky. Jurei's expression remained unchanging, but his eyes grew distant and guilty. And then, he had an idea. A stupid, reckless, ridiculous idea. One for the record books, really. He'd had ideas before, never as brilliant as the gifted Tsunades or the also gifted but super fucking creepy Rachimarus, but still, ideas. Some of them even worked. But this Onithus one had everything. Drama, intrigue, action. Horribly reckless. Probably. Potentially a spark for international conflict. The chance was pretty small, but definitely non-zero. Would it fix the guilty godparent-sized hole he didn't know he had that had suddenly appeared in his stomach and sucked in his insides? Well, that he'd just have to see. But, never one to get worked up because being a cool master ninja took constant effort, Jurea leaned back casually and turned his head towards the blonde. So he said lazily. You want to learn something cool. Naruto nodded, blue eyes longingly watching the crimson evening cloud soar through the sky. I want to learn something that, when every other ninja sees it, they almost crap their pants in fear. I want to learn something that that bastard, Sasuke, can't steal from me, and that will knock the pants of these stupid judges. The sage nodded as the boy described his wishlist with a knowing grin. Well, that would definitely work. But, the whims of a 13-year-old were hardly enough to justify this idea. He needed at least something a little more justifiable than a view that essentially boiled down to notice me, I'm a good ninja. 
If you found a jutsu, Jiraiya continued, something that fit all of those categories. Jiraiya tilted his head towards the boy and let his voice take a more serious tone. What would you do with it? I'd use it like I use every other jutsu I know. The blonde replied back without a moment's hesitation. Whatever helps me become strong so I can be the Hokage and protect my precious people. And suddenly, Naruto's whisker marks faded away, and it wasn't Naruto lying next to him. The new man had the same neon blonde hair and the same blue eyes. There was a goofy, lopsided smile on his face. Believe it. Like a lightning bolt, Jiraiya shot to his feet. Kid. Jiraiya declared, a smug smirk sneaking across his lips as he rounded on the startled boy. Meet me here tomorrow morning at the crack of dawn. That early. Naruto shot back, utterly confused at the sudden burst of movement. What for? If at all possible, Jiraiya's grin got even wider. I've got something I think you want to learn. These seats had better be good, forehead. From her spot, Sakura bristled, but remained zen. The seats were good, after all. She'd shown up nearly three hours early to ensure they'd all gotten a front row seat to Sasu Kun's fight. As if she'd sit in the nosebleed for such an event. As if, pig. Sakura said, finally, moving aside and patting the seat next to her that she had saved for her best frenemy. Where's Chaoji and Shikamaru? I thought they were coming with you. Ina rolled her eyes with a huff. I told Shika to make sure Chaoji left some food at the concession stand for the rest of the audience before he went to get warmed up. Sakura gave a small gasp and stared at her friend slack-jawed. Ino. She exclaimed, scandalized. You can't say that about your teammate. For a moment, Ino was confused at the sudden accusation, but her face suddenly became gravely serious. I'm not joking. Sakura blinked, unsure of how exactly to handle such a statement, but was saved from her confusion by the arrival of most of Team 8. Yo, Sakura. Ino. Barked Kiba, sliding into two seats in front of the girls and slinging his feet up on the railing. Thanks for saving us such rocking seats. Anada, taking great care to only occupy the space of one seat, gave a small bow in appreciation to the Team 7 matriarch. Why yes. She stammered quietly, thank you Sakura-san. Oh. Sakura laughed, waving away their gratitude, it was nothing. I'm just happy we all get to sit together. For sure. Kiba nodded, a feral grin stretching across his lips. And hopefully watch our teammates kick some foreign ninja as ow. Damn it woman. Possibly, Ino unrolled the fight bill she had turned into an impromptu mace and leaned back into her seat. Those foreign ninja are sitting right behind us, dog brains. Who cares? Kiba countered, though noticeably quieter than before. My boy Shino is gonna kick some major ass. Well I'm sure, Ino challenged, leaning back and checking her nails to accentuate her condescension. That Shino had prepared far more thoroughly than you would have, dog breath. The blonde chose to make a dramatic pause for the sole purpose of basking in the low, growling noise coming from the Inuzuka before continuing. But, she finished with a matter-of-fact tone, Shika's been training with Asuma sensei all month. And he's even been awake for it all. I'd say he's got this tournament on lock. The implications of the conscious Nara were lost on no one. It was one of their generation's open secrets, much to the confusion of their academy teachers, but each and every student, when asked who the smartest in the class was, would point straight at the usually sleeping scion of the Nara class. For Shikamaru to actually be awake and actively interested in training would be very, very troublesome for his opponent. More interesting to Sakura, however, than Shikamaru's sudden deviation from narcolepsy was the almostbred inflection in Ino's voice as she described the teammate. The same teammate who, just months before after assignments, Ino had spent over an hour venting to Sakura, finding new and creative combination of the words shit, lazy, and asshole. Well Kakashi-sensei has been training Sasu-kun all month, too. Sakura countered, never one to let Ino have the last laugh. He's been showing him his elite signature jutsu, so I don't think anyone else stands a chance. From his seat, Kiba suddenly staggered, his hands flying to the side of his face with a dramatic gasp. What? He whispered, turning to the others bewildered, Sakura thinks that Sasuke is going win something. I am shocked, shocked, I tell you. Sakura's fist was already posed to strike, but Ino's rolled up fight bill beat her to the punch, whacking the Inuzuka upside the head. Don't be a jackass, mutt. Ino glared, she's allowed to root for her teammates. Fibber rolled his eyes, waving his chastisement away with a dismissive hand. Please, he shot back. Then let's hear her support her other teammate. You, no, the one who barely got by me to be here. Sakura blinked. Yeah, Sakura-san, Chaoji smacked, suddenly entering the conversation only after fisting another handful of popcorn into his mouth. What about Naruto? Sakura blinked again, confused. What about Naruto? It was only as the blank stares of her classmates met her own that Sakura came to the sudden and startling conclusion that she had completely forgotten about the blonde idiot. 
Gibba, always the first to comment, slapped a hand to his face with a sigh. Unbelievable. He muttered, I mean, I know he's dead last and all, but sheesh. Get out of Sasuke's butt for like two seconds, would ya? No. Sakura shot back, rolling onto the defensive. I just he don't know where he is. I haven't seen him in a month. Ino gave the girl a look that made Sakura feel like she'd rather be hiding under her covers at home. You mean to tell me that you, his teammate in general center of orbit, haven't heard a peep from the single loudest ninja in the history of ninja? Well. It sounded stupid when you said it like that. No, I know. But. But she didn't know. She honestly had no idea where the boy had been or who he had been training, but she suddenly felt absolutely awful for not knowing. Idiot or not, Naruto was her teammate. Of course, she wanted him to do well. Duel he didn't come to our training ground. Sakura felt her stomach churn at how pitiful of an excuse that was. And you didn't wonder where he had been. Sakura didn't even register who had asked her, as suddenly the arena pa system burst to life. Lord Hokage. Hiding annoyance from his face, Saratobi turned to the veiled Kazakiage with a well-practiced welcoming smile. Yes Lord Kazakiage. Their village is quite lovely. This arena is truly something to remember for a lifetime. Outwardly, the aged cage's lips drew into a gracious smile. He even complimented the gesture with a small nod from his seat. I thank you Lord Kazakiage. Many people great individuals work tirelessly at its upkeep. Inwardly, the Sandane bit down a sneer. He was already on edge with his wayward student running rampant through the examination, the last thing he needed was to be hounded with asinine questions by an overbearing foreign leader. What's more, the Kazakiage was different in the last he had met the man. Less hardline autocrat more creepy movie villain, his Anbu had confided to him after surveilling the man for hours. Siratobi sighed. As if he needed more stress at his age. And for the opening match of these, tune in exam finals, please welcome Hayuga Niji to Arena Center. Joining Niji for his final preparations is his squad leader, Maido Gai of Kanahagakur. The arena erupted into a raucous applause. Hayuga were always a crowd favorite in home exams. The clan usually shelled out thousands to reserve prime seats for all its members, main house and branch. Even at Chunin level, the opportunity to witness the legendary Byakugan was a treat in and of itself. I have heard much of this boy's master. The Kazakuja's gravel voice seemed to hiss. He must have trained a truly formidable student. Siratobi nodded firmly. At least this was conversation about the task at hand, for once. Maido Gai is one of Kanoha's foremost Tejutsu experts. Young Niji is extremely capable for a shinobi his age. The Kazuki had chuckled behind his veil, his eyes locked on the arena. Then let us hope his challenge is up to the task. And now, facing Hayuga Niji in round one, please welcome Yuzumaki Naruto to the arena. For a moment, the arena was silent, and the Hokage felt his heart clench in his chest. But then, he heard it. Slower, and definitely less enthusiastic than for the first combatant, Saratobi was unable to fight a proud smile that stretched across his face as the crowd gave a Kanoha Shinobi support. It had seemed that things might finally be looking up for TH. There was a sudden surge of static, and the announcer burst back over the paw. Assisting his apprentice in his final preparations as Lord Jureya of the Sanin. The moderate applause that had filled the arena went silent, and Saratobi lurched in his chair. Lord Hokage. The Kazakiya said urgently, his voice alarmed. I was not told Lord Jureya would be in attendance. You were not told, Lord Kazakiya. The elder cage grit out tersely, his eyes narrowing at the sudden surprise. Because I was not aware of the sudden development. From the arena, both men watched as a tuft of neon blonde hair entered the arena, shadowed by a long, white mane. The two exchanged a hushed conversation, the crowd noise offering no obstacle to communication because the arena remained in a stunned silence. The sage tussled the blonde's hair, and Saratobi watched as his former student dashed away, narrowly avoiding an embarrassed left hook from the boy. Saratobi closed his eyes, searching desperately for his center. Student mine he growled internally, I swear if you've done something stupid I will. Sensei. Both cages turned to find a beaming Jureya casually making his way down the balcony towards their section, almost skipping as he approached. Lord Kazakiage, the Sanin said with a reverent bow as he approached. I apologize for the intrusion. I hope I am not disturbing you. The Kazakiage nodded slowly in response, hesitating for a moment before acknowledging the greeting. Gureya of the Sanin. The veiled man replied. To what do we owe this honor? I was unaware you would be in the city. Gureya gave a shrug and a small laugh at his own machinations. Well, I put in a lot of effort on my new apprentice, already. Figured I'd come and see if he was worth it. Saratobi had a vivid fantasy of him smashing his chair over his student's head, but managed to brush it aside. Just barely. Gureya Kun. The Hokage said, his voice grand fatally and warm. What a wonderful surprise. We have so much to discuss. 
Tsuritobi forced himself to smile at his words, barely restraining his urge to knock his former pupil upside the head. But, first, are my ears deceiving me? Are you substituting in for Haddock-san at present or? Nah. Jiraiya waved his hand dismissively as he walked around next to his teacher. Just sent you the paperwork yesterday. I took on a new apprentice. Teacher and student's eyes met, and a silent battle flared to life. Did you now? The sage nodded. Yep. And let me tell you, sensei. I think this one's a winner. You've taken Naruto-kun. Yep. As an apprentice. Jiraiya lazily scratched his head with a yawn. No shortage of paperwork to take him off the roster, but I bet you'll see it on your desk tomorrow. Saratobi's hands wrapped around the ends of his chair and the wood began to whine under the pressure. Since when did you decide on this arrangement? Last month. There were no words that the Hokage wanted to say that were appropriate for current company. Or even private company, for that matter. And what he trailed off, his voice wavering slightly as a small crack began to spiderweb down the arm of his chair. Pray tell, have you been teaching young Naruto-kun over the past month? At this, Jiraiya leaned back and gave a nervous laugh. You know, he said, leaning closer to the Hokage's chair. That is actually something I'd like to talk to you about. The arena was bigger on the inside. Sure, it had looked huge as they had walked inside, the story's tall stone structure stuck out like a sore thumb against the Kanoha skyline. Massive as the Colosseum may have looked on the outside, the moment you stepped in the center. Niji scoffed as he watched the blonde boy gaze around like an idiot. Are you going to continue gawking like a fool? The Hayuga taunted, or were we going to fight? Naruto snorted as he swung his arms in a cross-body stretch. Well. He shot back brightly. Picking up being a douch right where you left off, huh? Bulgarities. Niji spat, shifting into a stance. I should expect nothing less from trash like you. Easy there, tough guy. Naruto replied with a smirk. Won't look good when trash knocks your teeth in. Niji's face remained undisturbed, but the sudden tensing of his stance let Naruto know that the sentiment had been received. Proctor. The Hayuga demanded. May I begin? From his spot nearby, Hei gave a tired sigh. Why were the genin always such drama queens? Not yet. He commanded, chewing idly on his pick. I haven't gotten the signal. You two keep insulting each other or whatever makes you feel special inside. As much as he resented the flippant response, Niji resolved that goading his opponent was, if nothing else, cathartic. It is your destiny to lose this battle. He declared to the blonde. Even if you are now the student of the Sanin. It has been decided from the moment you were doomed to face me. Naruto, who had been mid-stretch on his calves, groaned. Oh, for crying out loud. He replied, rolling his eyes. You're still on this bullshit. You are a failure. You will suffer the fate of all failure. Oh, yeah. The blonde whispered, his eyes narrowing as he sank into a battle stance. I've seen what you think of failures. Niji smirked, vindicated and hitting a nerve. You're as foolish as she is. Am I? Naruto shot back, matching Niji's pacing around Hade, as the Jounin raised his hand in preparation to start the match. Or maybe we're both onto something. Niji let loose a dark, mocking laugh. Your delusion is truly pitiful. And the stick stuck up your ass is really annoying. Hayate's hand fell, and Niji surged forward in a rage, his open palm slamming into Naruto's chest and sending the boy hurtling back. The blonde had only just managed to right himself when he gave a yelp, diving to the side as he dodged a second barrage of attacks. What's wrong, dead last? Niji shouted as he relentlessly pursued the blonde across the battlefield, his missed strikes leaving small craters in the ground. Where has your bravado gone? The Jebushin. There was an audible gasp in the arena as one genin became ten, but Niji remained non-pulsed. Clones. He scoffed, blood surging around his eyes as the Byakugan flared to life. You think to run from the all-seeing eye of fate with clones. Three of the clones, forming a triangle formation, charged at the Hayuga. The first punch struck air as Niji effortlessly twisted his body out of the path of the strike, slamming his palms into the guts of two attackers. The third, however, hit its mark. The chakra-infused haymaker made contact with Niji's jaw, and the Hayuga was tossed like a rag doll to the side. Solid clones. The Hayuga muttered, climbing back to his feet and shifting his stance yet again. Unexpected. Niji's eyes narrowed, his pale white orbs seeing all. But it won't save you. The remaining seven clones charged and there was a flurry of limbs followed by six puffs of smoke. Only one of the Naruto's didn't disappear, and that one was sent sprawling to the ground with a thud and a worrisome cracking noise. Worthless. Niji said evenly, slowly striding across the arena while Naruto struggled to his feet. A loser like you never stood a chance against my might. Squirm as much as you please, worm, but you will never be able to change what you are. Destiny has already decided your fate. Niji saw the boy heave deeply, and he smirked. Crying. What a disgrace of a nindot. Laughing. 
from his spot on the ground, shakily rising back to his feet, the sound escaping from the blonde wasn't of surrender, but like the funniest joke he'd ever heard, had just been whispered into his ear. Niji saw red. You dare? He roared, engorged veins throbbing around his eyes. The blonde, through fits of giggles, tried unsuccessfully to rein himself in, weakly holding up a hand. I just, he stammered between spurts, whipping his eyes of tears. I mean, you're just fitting this mold so perfectly it hurts. This is exactly like Eurosen and said it would go down. Niji froze, despite his overwhelming urge to juke in the blonde into a wall. Be what? But Naruto could barely focus, the situation was just too funny to him. You're trash. The blonde growled, air quotes following his words. You can't beat me because fate. Blah, blah, blah. Monologo. Monolu. Monoli. Niji maintained his glare as the blonde seemed to trail off whispering to himself. From up in the stands, Jiraiya slapped a hand to his face, mortified. Mono. Monologue. Oh, that's it. Monologue. Niji's face held unbridled rage as he slipped once more into his stance. I was going to allow you to surrender once you were beaten. The Hyuge growled. But now, I'm going to beat you into unconsciousness. Naruto, seemingly recovering from his forgetfulness, replied with a smirk as his hand reached into his back pocket. Doze your final words carefully, dead last. The blonde grinned. You know the problem with spending your life looking up for your destiny written in the stars. Naruto pulled out a single three-pronged kunai and focused intently on a toss as Niji charged. Us losers will walk right by you. With fluid ease, the Hyuga shifted just centimeters to the left, allowing the kunai to pass harmlessly past him as he surged forward, hands blazing with chakra. His eyes narrowed in, looking to engrave the blonde's helpless look forever in his memory. But Naruto smirked. And then there was a brilliant yellow flash. I don't own Naruto, but it means a lot to me. For a moment, everything was perfect. Sunlight, late summer gold across the field like warm rain. Wind rustled the land and the nearby trees, branches swaying in tune to the melody of the forest. Serene. Meditative. A perfect zen space where. HLLP. Ureya's face contorted, eyes straining to close even deeper. Deep breaths, in and out and in and out, as he returned to the Garden of the Serenity in his mind. The noise faded, and the low rustle of the leaves returned. The sun's dull heat flushed across his face. He was here, and here was he. One with the grass and the ground. Nature breathing in, his own body breathing out in a perfect cycle of. Sesensei. Ureya closed his eyes harder. More peace. More serenity. Sensei I think the voice moaned. It was so loud. The leaves felt distant. Jiraiya was fighting with every ounce of discipline he had. His own cell screaming peace against the wave of distraction that only sought to distance him from the serenity of Theotha. I'm gonna hurl. Naruto clenched, a dry squelch squishing into his throat. The Zen was gone, and Jiraiya's finger snapped up and pointed away into the woods. That way. He ordered. If you're going to lose your stomach, again, you do it that way. The blonde's body trembled and swirled in a scramble for the tree line. He made it four or five shuffles before being overcome. Leg. It was much worse, Jiraiya decided, now that the boy was only dry heaving into the ground. He'd lost any actual sustenance stored in his stomach hours ago. The sound without the event was more grating on his ears than the actual vomit. I just Naruto began, attempting to refind his footing. I just can't get over the twist. Every time I jump my whole body just feels sore on. You're summoning yourself, kid. Jiraiya said, forcing his mind back from the display. You've got to get used to relaxing your notion of spatial positioning. Spatial Naruto squinted. Spatial what? What Jiraiya wanted to do was turn and walk away right there. Or scream. Maybe both. Now, however, he just gave a slow and measured nod. Three weeks of disappointment had tapered his expectations, somewhat, and he was able to keep the totality of his disappointment bottled up inside. Listen, he answered, reaching to his right and plucking a single leaf from a fallen branch. I need you to be like this leaf when you think about where you are. Naruto appraised the leaf with the same expression that children have when listening to business talk or advanced number theory. Huh? Was the response. I don't get it. You can't stop, Jiraiya the sage growled in his mind. Remember. Keep the disappointment inside. Remember why you're doing this, Jiraiya. You made a decision. A commitment. The sage exhaled and spoke. I know. He said. I know you don't get it. But do your best to follow here. See this leaf. The nod blue eyes trained like a simple-minded hawk onto the greenery. Okay, so this leaf is, right now, in my hand. Naruto double-checked the leaf was, in fact, still in Jiraiya's hand. It was. He nodded. Yes. The bar had been lowered so much, Jiraiya found himself pleased with the smallest of victories. Okay. So watch what happens. Without a sound, Jiraiya let go of the leaf stem. 
flittering in the afternoon wind, it drifted down and down and down before crashing silent against the grass. Naruto's eyes followed it the whole way, unblinking. Okay. Jiraiya spoke again. Where is the leaf, now? Naruto blinked. Twice. Thrice. On the hesitation. Uncertainty. On the ground. Without a word, the sage bent down and plucked the leaf up, returning it to the palm of his hand. And now? Back in your Naruto answered slow. Hand. This isn't a trick question. Jiraiya assured. I had the leaf in my hand, and then I dropped it. The leaf was on the ground, and then I picked it up and put it back in my hand. Now, the sage continued, here's the real question did the leaf think about where it was? The leaf. Yes. Did the leaf think? Yes. What the heck does that mean? The blonde protested. Leaves don't think. How the heck is this supposed to help? But the hand, Jiraiya interrupted his student's oncoming rant and met Naruto's gaze with a burning seriousness. Exactly. The sage said. This isn't a trick question. Leaves don't think. But Naruto protested. But what does that mean? It means, you little shit, Jiraiya answered. That you need to stop thinking and just start being. This leaf doesn't think about where it is it just is. You're having this difficulty because every time you jump, you're thinking about where you were instead of just accepting where you are. For a long moment, Naruto seemed to take in his teacher's words with a grave seriousness. I think the blonde said after almost a minute of silence. That this is a crummy way of teaching this. Jiraiya groaned, pinching the bridge of his nose with his fingers. Listen. He snapped. They don't exactly write guideline analogies for space-time ninjutsu. Can you just try it? Not thinking. Jiraiya nodded. It should be second nature to you. Naruto gave his teacher a scathing look, but only turned his back, storming towards the training grounds. Across from him in the field, a single wooden log sat with a piece of paper adhered to its surface. The paper was a maze of symbols and calligraphy. All right. Naruto all but growled to himself, pushing his mind away from his dumb, insulting new teacher and back to figuring out how the hell this worked. Don't think. He repeated. He thought it, too. Don't think. Don't think. No think. No. Think. No think. No think. No. There was a brilliant flash, a yellow explosion across the course. Then nothing. Reality seemed to tilt and then Naruto reappeared behind the dummy. His breath was ragged, rasping at the sudden return to existence. I'm not he whispered, whirling with excitement towards Jiraiya. I'm not gonna hurl. Jiraiya said nothing as he rose from his seat and approached the log. Extending his hand, his fingers wrapped around a three-pronged kunai buried 30 centimeters into the wood. There was a thunk as he yanked the knife from the divot. Jiraiya's lips stretched into a low, tooth-filled grin with a click of his tongue. Now this he began, his eyes moving to Naruto with a fire that caught the blonde in his step. Like being seen for the first time as something. Potential. Naruto's heart swelled at the thought, but his elatement was subdued by an undignified yelp as the kunai rocketed near his feet and embedded itself in the dirt. The sage spun on a heel, waving his hand. Do it again. The moment it was thrown, Niji knew what it was. Small, glistening. A seal-wrapped handle beneath a trident spike of metal. There wasn't a shinobi on earth of didn't know the tools of the flying thunder god weapons of Kanoha's yellow flash. What didn't process, didn't click inside his mind, was what happened after that. A village idiot knowing one of the most powerful jutsu in history was like imagining a carp lobbing a samurai's katana from a stream. In Niji's mind, even giving the event odds, as though it was something that happened in reality, was absurd. Much higher on the list of likely options were that the idiot had picked up a replica in some backwater second-hand replica store for loser shinobi, who lose and thought it would give him an edge. For a moment, he pictured a wide-eyed and mystified Naruto, eagerly drinking in the every word of a half-rate common, promising the blonde the speed of the fourth if he uses these 100% guaranteed authentic replicas in battle. If he hadn't been so full of frothing hatred, he might have pitted the fool. Replica or not, the kunai the blonde had thrown was two things sharp and headed directly for Niji's face. The prudent move was to dodge, and so he would. The tactical move was a little more complex, but he was a genius, after all. Lean left, pivot off back his back foot. Surge forward, use your momentum. Hold your left arm weak, with the right arm ready to blast forward forward and claim victory. Quick. Efficient. Foolproof. But none of that happened. There was no counter-attack, no perfectly poised strike. Niji had not gotten so far as to pivot on his back heel before everything seemed to stop. An explosion of yellow. Naruto's voice sounded like he just ran to Kumo and back, and Niji could feel the boy's heaving chest behind him. His Byakugan could see the blonde's knees, hands, his whole body shaking on the brim of exhaustion, but Niji could barely focus on such things. His mind was reeling, a flashbang of confusion clouding his battle plan. He couldn't move, couldn't retaliate. 
the only thing he could focus on was the icy prick of steel pressed against the skin of his throat. Ah, ah, asshole Naruto rasped. The way the blonde's chest heaved, Niji wondered just how much energy the move consumed. I wouldn't move if I were you. I sharpened the shit out of this thing. On cue, Niji felt metal-like ice scald against the warmth of his skin. His breath caught against his throat, and he swallowed hard. A prick tinged his jaw, and his mind agonized over the single, wet droplet he could feel rolling towards his chest. Impossible Niji's mind reeled, muscles tensing and fury surging. There was no way that he was being restrained. No way that what had just transpired was real. Dinjutsu. His mind roared, seeing through the deception. You think this will stop the all-seeing eye of the Byakugan? Niji declared, fingers flying into a seal as he channeled his chakra. Parlor trick Jinjutsu won't save you. Kai. The assembled Colosseum waited on bated breath, all eyes glued to the scene. Niji waited, eyes ready for that familiar fade of a false reality like dust on the wind. But there was no fade. No shimmer to reveal the truth. Reality persisted, constant, the only sound the haggard exhales of his captor. What? The prodigy whispered, his voice wavering into a far-off swirl, as the heaviness of the body pressed against his back weighed down like a train. Hi. Again. And again. A fourth time. What? Niji seethed. What is happening? So much for genius, eh? Naruto rasped, but the exhaustion couldn't mask the smugness in his voice. It ain't a jinjutsu, so you can cut that shit. If the taunt was meant to enrage him further, Niji couldn't tell. His mind was busy piecing together the last four seconds of reality. Nothing, yellow, knife at his throat. Nothing, yellow, knife at his throat. Victory, yellow, defeat. But Yuniji's whispered, voice awash in confusion as his Byakugan faded. Veins eased back, leaving nothing but milky white orbs that looked like the sea he was lost in. Not a Jinjutu. Ha, huh, yeah. Niji didn't need his all-seeing eyes to see pride wrapped itself around the boy's words. It filled his stomach with a writhing lurch. Master Jureya calls it space-time ninjutsu, or something. Naruto explained, as though his words were normal and any of this was normal and not living in an upside-down world. The blonde gave a casual shrug, as though further technical details escaped either his memory or his interest. It's kind of complicated, but it's cool as hell. Space-time ninjutsu Niji repeated. It was less a statement and more weighing whether or not those words were real. He was snapped from his thoughts as the pinch of steel brushed against his neck. Boy, Proctor. The blonde hollered, shifting his head to make eye contact with the still dumbfounded Hayate, falling disinterested with the Hayuga's ramblings. This counts as a submission, yeah. The Jounin didn't respond, and Naruto had time to ponder how the toothpick stayed hanging, even though the Proctor's mouth was gaping open. Hayate's response was a racking cough, which was good because it hid the utter shock running down his nerves. Memories of yellow flashes swirled just behind his eyes, and, suddenly, the image of a blonde, loud Madgenin looked too much like a poster he'd had in his room as a child. No. Hayate said, his voice monotonous and droll because it didn't matter if this kid had summoned a Bijuu, he had an appearance to keep up. Jounin didn't gape at Jenin, and he'd be damned if the whole village would see the crumbling of his meticulously cultivated aesthetic. Your opponent is standing. Victory is by knockout or forfeit. He continued, before raising an eyebrow. Knockout, forfeit, or death, that is. Either way, giving him a hug from behind won't cut it. Something about the phrase or death when combined with a bladed knife brought Niji's arms empty to his side. Shock gave way to the reminder that he was, in fact, being held hostage. Well shit. Naruto said, and Niji was reminded that he was being held hostage by an idiot. I'm going to be honest, I don't have a clue how I could knock you unconscious right now without you maybe escaping. And that's not going to work, for me. So, what? Niji hissed, inhaling deep and trying to calm his mind back into Zen. He shifted in the blonde's hold, pushing at the common escape points of a bind and biting down the frustration of discovering that someone seemed to have actually trained the idiot how to hold the knife poised at Niji's neck. You expect me to surrender? I mean, Naruto replied, sounding unsure how this was a conversation he was still having. The other option is her death, so yeah. I kind of figured. Niji said nothing, and his silence echoed throughout the arena. Setting his jaw, the Hayuga prodigy rose to his full height, his eyes leveling in the distance as his shoulders rolled back. The blade of the kunai remained glued to the thin red gorge it had cut, a hairline trickle ebbed by steel. Then kill me. Naruto audibly scoffed. I'm sorry. He offered, wondering if his grip around Niji's neck had been too tight. He could recall Jiraiya, just days before, describing the effects of loss of blood circulation for various body parts. Stupid suicidal declarations during a stupid contest seemed to fall right about there. Say what now? You heard me, Yuzumaki. Niji replied, and Naruto didn't like the way his name sounded like a dirty word when Niji said it. 
The blonde's jaw clenched as he bit down the sudden urge to knead this jackass in the kidneys. Listen here, prick. Naruto all but growled, his voice and patience dried up by the encounter. I don't know who or what curled up your ass and died, but I'm here offering you a chance to. If you think you are sparing me by allowing me to surrender, you are mistaken. Niji interrupted, his voice like rocks grating against steel. Naruto's face contorted, his annoyance only receding for confusion to take its place. No. The blonde reasoned back, his words slow and deliberate. I think you're misinterpreting the other option in the surrender or death equation. You see, death is, like, not the one you want to pick. It was difficult, as the village pariah spoke to him in metered patronizing tones, for Niji to not fling himself forward onto the blade. The kunai at his neck was sharp, but was it really worse than being held lectured to by the intellectual equivalent of a farm animal? He exhaled and let the rage travel down his arms and dissipate in the clench of his fist. Spare me your opinions, I care not. Niji replied, his voice and gaze piercing into the concrete wall 20 meters away. I don't know what kind of trickery you managed to pull or whether that was even what I think it was. Either way, I'll not be mocked by trash such as you. Kill me and be done with this. Do not allow my failure to linger. The demand was met by nearly a minute of stunned silence before Naruto's brain could think of a response. Okay. I'm sorry, what the actual fuck is wrong with you? Niji scowled, lips curling in a digest. If only the blonde idiot had the biakigan, then he might have been able to see the contempt rolling across his face. Enough of your vulgarities. Fate is decided. Fate. Naruto spat, like the words scalded his throat to even utter. Niji fraught a wince as the blonde's nails curled, digging into the skin on his arm. You think I beat you because of fate. It wasn't a question. But trash didn't dictate the terms even in the jaws of defeat. Fate is the all decider. Fate is. Listen up, you freaking turd. Naruto snarled, the end of his short patience sizzling like a fuse. I don't know who the hell you think you are, but I whooped your ass because you underestimated me, just like Jiraiya Sensei said you would. I pulled a fast one with a kickus new jutsu, and now you go and attribute it to fate. The blonde heaved, heavy and hot, and Niji wondered if he was truly about to slit his throat. He inhaled, stealing his mind and vision, and prepared to be dispatched. But the blow never came. Naruto's chest rolled with a low chuckle. Fuck, he whispered, hand still shaking and blade still poised at Niji's throat, so sharp and so unsteady. No wonder Hinata tried so hard to kick your ass. You're ridiculous. Shut up. Niji seethed, fingers balling into the fists he so desperately wanted to bury in the blonde's stomach. His eyes saw all, and all turned red. You know nothing of what transpired that fight, and I'll sooner die than hear nameless trash like you justify the Hayuga. You know nothing of our history, nothing of the oppression of the main branch. Main branch. Naruto replied, voice lost and naive. Niji breathed, and fire filled his belly, what the hell does you being a fucking prick have to do with the main branch? Everything. Niji's reply was so quick, so desperate and filled with hate that it scared even him as it left his tongue. His nails buried themselves into his palm because his body couldn't flare with the seething fury that it wanted to. It has everything to do with them. She represents everything that fate has ever wrought into my life. Every injustice, every loss Niji's voice grew distant, but his body trembled from the torrent flooding out of him. His head fell, and his milk-white eyes poured distantly into his bloody palms. Fate may have given me this destiny. His voice was barely a whisper, but it shook through his soul. But I will not be mocked by the rise of failures such as her. For a moment, Naruto remained silent. This was a stunning turn of events, really, as, even a month prior, his immediate response would have been something adversarial. Some know it all ponce with onks to make even that Sasuke bastard green with envy. Naruto, naturally, would rise above such provocation. He'd say something cutting and deep, like any real hero should. Cry me a river, douch. You're the real monster here, asshole. Fuck you, dude. But that was the old Naruto. Old Naruto said things quickly, because you could say things quickly when you didn't think about what you said. New Naruto wasn't much better, honestly, but there was something, maybe a little. Well his his heart and his fists voted that fuck you was the best way to answer the onks sandwich getting verbally fed to him, something Jiraiya had told him before their fight fogged his mind. Fogged it and clouded his thoughts like when he left the house and couldn't remember if he turned the stove off. That destiny you're talking about. For you. Naruto began, voice unsure and unfamiliar with discourse. He wasn't used to having prior knowledge before going into a situation. This was untested waters. You talking about the caged bird thing? Like a waterfall onto a campfire. Niji could feel the blood, wet and sticky and dripping from the holes his anger and nails had bore into his palms, but the tension and rage dissipated like mist. His breath hitched. His eyes were cloudy. You he croaked, and he felt light and skinny and it was like he'd gone blind. His throat went raw. His heart thundered. How do you know about that? 
Naruto squirmed but steeled himself. He'd start a conversation, now. He was using his words, not his fists, to explain his opinions. Ironically, this lesson in dialogue over violence had been forcibly beaten into his head by Jiraiya for the past three weeks, but Naruto couldn't worry about that right now. Yeah Naruto answered, Jiraiya sensei told me about it. Said it's pretty shitty. A lifetime of oppression. An entire family line, subjugated and ground into the dirt by their own kin. Forced to walk around with a brand that could cripple their body and tear asunder their mind at the call of a single hand seal. And the dead last say pretty shitty. Shitty. Niji repeated, numb and feeling a previously unfelt level of rage building in his body, like a tornado going through a volcano. He was going to turn around, kunai to the neck be damned, and he was going to throttle that ignorant little. Human beings aren't meant to be subject to one another. Slaves. Naruto said. His voice sounded deeper, lost but not unsure. Niji found his voice dried up. He mentioned he thought he had a way to remove it. Naruto finished. The seal, that is. Niji sputtered, and his murderous train skidded off the tracks and caught fire. His tongue turned to lead. He didn't realize his fist uncurled. Remove. He whispered. Remove the seal. Yeah. Naruto answered with a cough and maybe empathy. Niji couldn't tell. He doesn't bring it up with the Hyuga being here and all, but he was showing me some of the outline. It's sort of like the one on. Niji didn't realize that Naruto stopped himself just short of saying me. In fact, Niji wasn't aware of much of anything anymore. The ground and the world were uncertain and alien. His stomach lurched. Yaramov. Niji whispered, the words felt like secrets, say the many louder, and they would disappear like a dream. Niji felt called to voice one of the only questions he had ever had. Is there a way to remove the seal? The question lingered, and Naruto's answer stalled because he could feel what seemed the weight whole world hinge on his next response. Listen, he coughed, I don't want to get your hopes up, here. Master Jiraiya just wanted me to know your weaknesses, so he told me about that seal. He mentioned he'd found a way, and he told me about your backstory. That's why he told me. I don't know any more about it, but he does. It was a bit of a cop-out, for sure, but still the truth. Naruto couldn't shake the vague notion that answering with something not truthful would have the Hyuga genuinely trying to kill himself. There was nothing more truthful than Naruto not knowing something, so that fit the bill. However. But we are, uh, kind of, like, in the middle of something here. He added. If you forfeit the match, I'll bring you to talk to him about it. He was so earnest, so painfully sincere in every stupid word that he could heave across his lips, it made Niji's chest hurt. The Hyuga prodigy exhaled, and his breath was like cracks in a dam. Still holding, still clinging but only just. Why? Naruto blinked. Why, what? Why, Niji answered, his voice wavering like a flag caught in a hurricane. Why tell me this? Why are you doing this? Listen, I just want to win this match, alright. Naruto answered. It wasn't the empathetic or caring thing to reply, but it was honest. Lying took energy, and he was just too damn tired to make up some sob story. You don't seem awful, you're just an asshole. Nobody deserves to live a life caged like that. I know Niji didn't understand why Naruto paused, but the hesitation in the blonde's words felt heavy like metal bars. It made his gut wrench, and Niji hated how he couldn't understand why. I know what it's like, alright. And it sucks. And when I'm Hokage, I'm not going to let anyone pull any of this kind of shit. But, I'm not Hokage yet, so I'm just going to start with helping you. Niji stayed silent for almost a minute, and Naruto began to worry that his words fell on deaf ears. That would pose a significant problem, as he could already feel his arm muscles begin to lock up, desperately crying for relief from the hold and. Proctor. Niji's voice was sharp as glass, and it cuts through the arena. I surrender. Hey nodded, and Niji felt the rush as the three-pronged kunai against his throat was whisked away. Delicate, almost reverently, it went back into the blonde's holster. The next moment, Niji was released. Naruto pushed off, shaking his arms to try and slough off the fatigue rolling up his muscles. Niji wasn't tired, but everything hurt. His feet drug little tracks into the dirt as he moved away. Holy. Shit. Naruto gasped, hands behind his head as he circled in place stalking because even if he was tired he couldn't not move doing it when I'm the one making the seal that's exhausting. From his spot a couple meters away, Niji gave a slow, shifting turn. His body twisting until milky wide eyes stared back into Naruto's pools of blue. The prodigy said nothing, and Naruto squirmed. So does some time later this week work? He offered, feeling exhausted and deeply uncomfortable as Niji's eyes just stared at him, all glassy and expressionless. Because, I've gotta be honest, I'm gonna need a minute or something. I'm still definitely not used to that. Are you telling the truth? Niji asked. He didn't move, didn't meet the blonde's eyes, and his voice barely even made it to his opponent. Huh? 
Naruto blinked, before waving a disinterested hand as he continued to pant like a dog. Oh, yeah. It's a promise. That's my ninja creed. I won't go back on my word. Niji stared for a long moment at the declaration in complete and utter silence. After three seconds of no movement, Naruto's face scrunched as the blonde shifted uncomfortably. Well? He demanded. Say something you weirdo. It was slight imperceptible even. But Niji didn't say anything. He laughed. One, then two, a giggle turned to a chuckle, a chuckle to full-blown barks of laughter. The sound echoed through the still silent arena and rippled out into the summer air. Naruto, unaware of what the hell was so funny, didn't laugh, took a cautious step back. He'd taken Niji for the broody type, and if Sasuke had ever started laughing, his first instinct would have been to back away slowly. He figured the same procedure would fit here. Good luck, Yuzumaki Naruto. The proud Hayuga called, the declaration echoing behind him as the prodigy entered the nearby tunnel and disappeared. Naruto stretched, pushing his hands to the base of his back, till he heard his spine pop in a few place. So he said loudly, turning towards Hayate. We done here. Cause I'm hungry. Hayate didn't know how to reply, but he was overwhelmed with relief that he hadn't signed on to take a genin team this year. Winner, Yuzumaki Naruto. Hiraya. People had forgotten Saratobi Hirazan. Age tended to do that. The years drag on, and the memories of how things used to be just seemed to erode. Saratobi Hirazan. The god of Shinobi. There was a time where he had been hailed as the second coming of Hashirama himself. Undisputed power, the will of fire reincarnate. The Noha under his gaze had been the most prosperous, the most protected in its history. But people had forgotten. For Jurea's money, it was the gimmicks. People only remembered the things that were flashy the things that stood out. Hashirama and his wood style, Taburama and his water jutsu, even though his forbidden jutsu were far, far more dangerous. Then Minato had come along, and everyone seemed to forget about poor aging Saratobi Hirazan. Hiraya knew better. Brutal efficiency. That was the way he described his former master. All the power, all the finesse and skill of his predecessors with none of the ego. None of the drama. People had forgotten how powerful the third Hokage was because no one he fought survived to tell some horror story of their battle. Efficiency was the most dangerous shinobi trait, and that's why Hiruzen was the god. A shinobi to be feared above all others on the battlefield. One who didn't fight for glory or infamy only purpose. The living incarnation of the will of fire. As Jureya turned to face his former master, his heart clenched in his chest. A pressure, a wave, surged through his body and sent a chill down his spine. Their eyes met, and Jureya stared down the flame. Come with me. The cage commanded. Now. It was a testament to decades of training and discipline that Jureya could even stand. The third Hokage's chakra wasn't flared, but the chill of his voice dug into the box like thunder. Jureya forced out a nod before turning, disappearing down the nearby corridor. Hiruzen rose from his chair, his movements metered, calculating. If one looked closely, there were spider web splinters left in the wood of his chair. Without another word, Hiruzen moved to follow his pupil until a voice called out from behind. Hokage-sama. The Kazakiage spoke. Saratobi paused, the company of the box forgotten in the turn of events. Yes, Kazuki Ajsama. The honorifics were there, but the conversation balanced on the edge of a razor. I was not aware the veiled cage questioned. His voice sounded different than before. Strained. Concerned. Scared. Akinoha had raised a second yellow flash. Saratobi's gaze was a line, his eyes watching in silence as a hapless boy heaved against his opponent in the arena. He exhaled, and the brim of his hat shaded his eyes from view. Then you now know, Kazuki Ajsama. If the Kazuki Aj expected more details, he was left wanting. The god of shinobi disappeared down the corridor behind his student. What? He growled as he reached Jureya. A fury. A fire. Have you done? You know exactly what I've done. Jureya countered. Like a man juggling fire. And if you're asking me, it's something that should have been done along. Do not. Hiruzen's voice is like an avalanche. No one is asking you. You do not get a voice. Do you have any idea what you've done? What I've done? Jureya growled. I've taught my student. What you've done, Hiruzen's presence swelled, a circle of cracks bursting into the concrete under his feet. Is given open bounty from every ninja nation on earth to a child. He's not a child. Jureya met Saratobi's accusation with a hiss. He's a soldier and he's been one since the day you let him join the academy. I let him join to protect him. Saratobi countered. To learn to control his stinks. To let him live a normal life. Normal. Jureya's hand smacked against the stone wall of the walkway. Spider-webbed fissures bloomed from the contact. Is that what you think he is? Normal. Naruto's never been normal and will never be normal. He is a child who deserves the right to live without a target on his back. He's always had one. Jureya snarled, eyes flaring. 
he's had a target on his back since the moment Minato stopped that monster, and all you've done is hamstring him by trying to not play favorites. The glare in Hiruzen's eyes was ice. You would lecture me? Hiruzen answered. You have the audacity to question my judgment. Brown eyes simmered beneath the brim of the Hokage's hat. You abandon the boy for 13 years and then walk in with the gall to question me. The cage seethed. I wouldn't have it. Audacity even from you. Gureya's teeth ground in his cheek with a click as he reared back to his full height. He was always taller than Hiruzen, but it felt like more, now. Trust me, he began. His voice was a mixture of will and shame and it tasted in his throat. A few things have become very clear, very quickly. I've plenty of blame on myself for assuming my pupil's son the Hokage's son would have been treated properly in the city he saved. Hiruzen hadn't been this angry in years, his fists trembled in his hands. Get out. When the tournament's through. Jureya answered. We will. We? Hiruzen balked, unsure if his anger had clouded his hearing. You think Naruto is going anywhere? Jureya nodded. Be will the sage replied, reaching into his pocket and pulling a small scroll from his belt. Because they're here looking for him, now. The tremor in the Hokage's hand slowed, tension easing, but for a moment in his fingers as he recalibrated his thoughts around the statement. Reaching forward, he snatched a scroll from his student's hand and read the text. Almost a minute passed before another word was spoken. Explain. Neither man was willing to let go of the tension, blades poised at throats, but the command shifted in Jurea's spine, and it was like he was reporting again. The report I got last week. He said. I was taking him after the tournament whether he was my pupil or not. For the first time, it was Saratobi who realized that realized he was not the only one to become old and bitter. The way they argued in his mind was student to teacher, but this this. There were too many lines under the war paint, now. Jurei was far more than just a child. Why he said. Did you not tell me this sooner? Because you look a lot more weak than you are when it looks like I'm not still scared of you. When I can come in and fight with you the sage replied. You look a lot easier to assassinate. The tension evaporated like a falling tide, but the new reveal lingered on the gaps like resin. Jurei would barely see his master's eyes in the dim light of the tunnel. So that was his play. Something was wrong, so to further the tension he publicly humiliates the Hokage in his own home. Such measures, such disrespect. Hiruzen found himself momentarily remorseful he had failed to see underneath the underneath. You're absolutely sure of this? No. Jurea answered. But their agents are here. Something's happening and whatever it is doesn't want us to be on speaking terms. But that's close enough for me. Saratobi pocketed the scroll in emotion, a silent nod in affirmation. Without a sound, the third Hokage was walking back to the box, alone. Gurea. He called out, tilting his head to only a profile. Do not be mistaken. This will not be the end of our discussion. Regardless of this report, you still made a decision that puts Naruto in grave danger. The topic of protecting Naruto is the priority, but Jurea's answer was like firm but cold. His gaze lingered and fingers flexed against his fist. With a silent pivot, Jurea began his march down the corridor. But, for once, we agree he called back. This conversation is far from over. No fucking way. It was Kiba, of course, whose voice broke through. He sounded like he'd seen a ghost, whispering and repeating into the silence. There's no fucking way. Absolutely no way. No fucking way. Shut up, Kiba. Ino hissed, but her eyes never left the center of the arena. In fact, all eyes in the stadium remained transfixed to the orange jumpsuit at the center. But Yu Chaoji whispered, putting down his chips and committing the entirety of his attention to something that wasn't food. Sakura, did you know about this? She was pretty sure that he nudged her shoulder, but Sakura wasn't home. Of course she didn't know. Kiba snipped. She didn't even know he'd been gone for a freaking month. Kiba, I said shut it. Ino growled, taking a defensive stance between her frenemy and the dog boy. Sakura could feel Ino's arm, gentle but alarmed, latch onto her own. Sakura. She diverted, head dropping into a conspiratorial tone. Was that what I think that was? Sakura opened her mouth, a fish gaping for an answer or an insight or anything that made sense, but nothing came. She shook her head and fumbled for words. I don't she stammered. I don't know what just happened. I do. Shikamaru's voice cut through the quiet like a knife, but his gaze was unflinching towards the center stage. His shoulders and frame were hunched, hand tracing his lips as his eyes absorbed the scene. It reminded Ino of how he looked playing his father in Shogi. A new piece was on the board. The game had been altered. Sakura could only watch in a stunned silence as three masked Anbu materialized around the blonde in a swirl of leaves. Their kunai were drawn, defensive. She recognized it asked the IP escort formation Alpha 6. They'd learned it in the academy as a cornerstone stance for defending mission critical targets against unknown assailants. Naruto. Her inner voice whispered. Why were they protecting Naruto? 
what was happening to Naruto. Who even was Naruto? Her name she'd yelled and berated and called out to over a thousand times, his name didn't sound sure anymore. The only source of reassurance she could take was that Naruto seemed to be equally startled and confused by his sudden security detail. Hey. He squawked. What the heck's the big idea? There was another swirl of leaves and Jiraiya was standing beside him, hand on his shoulder. He whispered something low and quick the blonde's ear, but Sakura couldn't make it out. For a moment, it looked like familiarity. Naruto was confused, and Sakura could almost hear the defiance welling up inside him, the refusal to listen or be told anything by anyone. But Naruto didn't fight back at all. The boy in the center bit his tongue and gave a steady nod. Jiraiya placed a hand on his shoulder, and Yuzumaki Naruto disappeared from the stadium in a puff of white smoke. Sakura stared at the empty space where her teammate had once stood in complete silence with the rest of the assembled arena. There was no cheering no cries or calls. The collective air seemed to be sucked out of the very arena, broken only by the static of a frazzled announcer over the paw. We're going to take a brief intermission. Please stand by. I don't own Naruto, but it means a lot to me. The rustle of leaves and the sound of desperate gasps. Ah, shit. Naruto let loose a low hiss through his teeth. He funneled more water from the canteen and promptly spat it out at his feet. It's like sprinting at 10k every time. With FLLT and other sounds Jiraiya could have done without, he took another swig and pushed a small stream of water through his teeth and onto a nearby rock. Naruto offered his master a questioning glance. As it get less he paused, finding the right word. Awful. Like, even a little. Jiraiya considered the remark with snort. I don't remember the fourth or the second complaining so much. He countered, eyes glued to the town below. You just aren't doing it right. Doing it right. Naruto's chest swelled and he took two steps forward with all his height. What do you mean doing it right? I thought I was doing just fine. Jiraiya snorted, an up and down glance to his preening apprentice. Kid, you're doing that jutsu like someone trying to carve the Hokage's monument with a stick of dynamite. Overwhelming force and non-existent finest. It's a miracle you can do it at all. Defiance was, of course, the first emotion that sprang to Naruto's mind. I don't see anybody else here doing it. Naruto grumbled, chest puffed and ego bruised. Jiraiya didn't immediately answer, but the small grimace that crossed his mind gave Naruto a moment's pause. Wait. He continued, slower and deliberate. I don't get it. Why don't I see anyone else doing this jutsu? Just because this was the first time the blonde was considering the question didn't mean it wasn't a good question. The Hiroshin no jutsu was, without question, one of the most widely known and feared jutsu on the planet. With all of its power, if a genin could learn it in a month, why wasn't every chunin worth their salt slaving day and night to try and master the technique? Jiraiya leaned back, but his shoulders looked heavy. The sage made a low clicking noise in his cheek. Performing the Hiroshin is more than just knowing the seals and channeling chakra. Naruto squinted, a calculating look across his features. I don't get it. Jiraiya let himself sigh, moving his vision from the horizon and back to his pupil. Before any shinobi can do a jutsu, there's two things that have to happen. The first, most obvious, is that they have to know the technique and have the chakra to perform it. Signs are patterns, stances, the works and then you have to have the juice. If they don't have the raw ingredients, the jutsu's never going to happen. So I just know the technique and have the chakra. Naruto floated. The face the blonde wore while trying to piece things together was like a child attempting to learn an instrument. Hesitant, more afraid of bad notes than bad practice. That's it. Jiraiya snorted, letting a smirk cross the left side of his cheek so that his student could see his humor at the comment. When you say it like that, yeah. But let's take a step back from the privileged tower and talk about how much of a jackpot you hit. The Hiroshin no Jutsu is one of the most complex ceiling configuration ever written. There are, maybe, four or five ceiling systems more complex than this Jutsu, and even fewer people on earth who know how to draw it properly. Jiraiya nudged the kunai in Naruto's hand, drawing his eyes to the lattice of ink and seal wrapped around the handle. The fact that I taught you how to draw that is almost double the number of people alive who know how to draw it for combat. Jiraiya continued, pulling the blade from Naruto's hand and tracing a finger along the writing's outer edges. Even Saratobi doesn't know the variant I decided to share with you. On top of that, the seal is too complex to copy on short notice. The ink degrades over time, and understanding the symbols before they faded would be all but impossible. It'd be like writing a whole book, a masterpiece word for word after hearing it whispered in a crowded bar. Naruto wasn't really sure how to respond to such information, the implication of his fortune or the reminder that the squiggles he had painstakingly learned to copy in the past month were really generational talent and seal form. Like solving the world's hardest test by memorizing the answer, beforehand. He let out a soft Ojureya laughed. Understatement of the century, kid. 
Jiraiya flipped the kunai into his hand, the metal tie prong slapping against his palm as he extended the handle to the blonde. I'll teach you the seal and what they mean in time, but you would be wise to not forget that you're wielding something you don't even come close to understanding right now. Naruto didn't have an answer for that, but he took the hilt as both their eyes wandered back onto the stadium in the distance. There was a buzz of crowd noise in the air, but the wind from atop the monument kept it to a low murmur. What's the other thing? Naruto called out, eyes narrowed in almost painful focus. Jiraiya blinked. What? You said every jutsu requires two things. For effect, he held out his fingers and counted just to be sure. One's knowing the technique, but you didn't say what the other thing was. Oh. It was Jiraiya's turn to fall quiet. Right. There was a pause, the sound of the wind passing in between, before Jiraiya found his answer. Some jutsu his words started, but his voice seemed to linger. Dragging its feet and hoping something else would pop up and end the conversation sooner than his next sentence would. Some jutsu need more than just knowing the technique in order to perform. Some jutsu require need the user to be compatible with hijutsu, too. Compatible. Naruto turned the word over on his tongue as he spoke. Like the jutsu won't work if you're not the right fit, even if you know all the steps. Hiraya gave a simple nod. Pretty much. Another pause. How'd you know I'd be compatible? Hiraya clicked his tongue again and rolled his thumb across his knuckles. He laughed, a single and hollow breath as his eyes met only the dirt. Just had a hunch. If Naruto wanted more, he was left wanting. The wind picked up, but the line of discussion drifted away on the northern gusts. Jirei wasn't sure if his pupil was reading the room or just picking a new topic, but he welcomed the subject change. So what the heck are we doing up here? Naruto asked, waving a vague hand over the sprawling city below. Why did you take us to the top of the monument? I wanted to watch the fights. Vantage point. Jiraiya replied. We're watching. Naruto's eyes narrowed. Advantage over what? Jiraiya made a small pained noise like a dying animal. Did. He pleaded. I don't want you to take this personally, but you and I are about to be spending a lot of time together. I want you to ask questions and learn, but I'm begging you. From the bottom of my heart if you do nothing else, I want you to think before every single thing you say. Not just let it roll on off your tongue and out into the air. Every word, every sentence. Give it a good hard think before you speak. I want good questions, only. The words left his mouth, but as his ears listened to himself a scowl etched across his own face. That was harsh, and his temper wasn't fair to the kid. Annoying. Yes. Deserving of ridicule. Maybe, but not right now. Ah, kid. He offered, shifting on his heels. I'm a little distracted and that was too. The sage stopped, trailing off as he realized he was talking to air. Naruto's eyes were on the stadium and his face a concerted scowl. Unmoving and unclenching save for frantic blue eyes that scoured the horizon. What are we watching for? The focus in the boy's voice was palpable. Jiraiya blinked. He blinked again. Naruto was still looking. Eyes squinted, staring into the sun without so much as a hand raised to help him see, but the boy was trying to hard the effort was palpable. Bending to one knee, the sage appraised his pupil with what felt like suspicion. We're looking he began, recording each twitch in the blonde's focus. For anything that looks odd. Suspicious. Something out of place. You mean sketchy? The blonde asked. Like that dude on the roof? In an instant, the binoculars were back in Jiraiya's hands. Anbu? The sage whispered, exposed. Yeah. Naruto grumbled, squinting his eyes further and trying to make up for the fact that all these people just kind of look like dots, but that one dot looked weird. Shouldn't they be like hidden? Jiraiya shoved the binoculars back into the boy's hands, Naruto bobbling the optics as he tried to pull the stadium back into view. Tell me. Jiraiya squatted, leaning into a crossed leg stance as his hands clasped in his center. What color masks are they wearing? Naruto strained against the glass, bopping his vision between the four figures now looming above the stadium roof. White masks. He answered, adding to the description. Maybe some, like, markings or face paint on them, too. And what are they wearing? Black. Naruto waved a hand down his own body, accentuating the full color palette of the mystery dots. Head to toe except for the white masks. Naruto turned, a strange and cool sensation tripping at the corner of his senses. The breeze was gone, noise and birds and sounds of the forest quieting, a silence stretching as it swirled around Jiraiya's energy. Were thossa dark lines forming under Jiraiya's eyes. Naruto leaned in closer to see if something was forming or if it was just his imagination or. That down. Jiraiya snapped, body shooting backwards and bringing Naruto slammed into the dirt beneath him. Naruto had time to gasp, but the rest of his alarm was frozen as the sound of distant explosions ripped through the silence. The horizon shimmered, a rolling curtain of air and wind popping seconds later as it crashed across the monument's head with winds whipping. 
Jiraiya's body held Naruto pinned for the blasts, but was up and back on the ridge the moment the shock wave subsided. Scrambling behind him, Naruto's mouth fell slacked as his eyes mirrored the roiling smoke. Fire. Naruto observed, words jumping to only what his eyes could process. Someone's exploding the tournament. Another explosion, Jiraiya's lips stretched to an unmovable line. Someone's attacking the city. He corrected, a litany of fires and distant screams popping like fireworks in the night sky. Naruto loved when fireworks exploded. Something in the way the distant pops of flame looked in the city made his stomach lurch. Something's wrong. Jiraiya whispered as the sound of explosions gave way to burning and fear. Naruto balked, eyeing between the explosions and his teacher, as the smoke roiled into the sky like little pillars of chaos. No shit. He exclaimed. Someone's attacking Konoha. That's not what I mean Jiraiya muttered, more to himself than to his student. The explosions were there but there was something more. Something that touched against his skin and whispered on the trees. There's something else. Something building something. The air clicked, and a screech exploded through the entire city. It wasn't an explosion, there wasn't force or fire or smoke, but Naruto felt his blood run cold as an invisible pressure exploded inside his veins. He felt like he was suffocating, being buried by a weight of something pressing down on his lungs until they popped. Just pure and distilled fear. Naruto had to stop his hands from trembling as a shifting figure appeared on the horizon west of the stadium. What what is that? Naruto stammered, hands flashing for his kunai with a white knuckle grip. Jiraiya's gaze hardened to a line as he channeled the churning in his chest. A demon. Jiraiya rose, rolling his back and shoulders as his eyes fixed on the source. Or, at least one trying to rip out of his host. Rip out of his even amidst a wave of pressure, the breath in Naruto's lungs seemed to evaporate. That kid Naruto's voice was a whisper. That kid from sand was a. The Ichibi, I imagine. Jiraiya confirmed. And it looks like the seal is ripping at the seams. That's not pure demonic chakra, but it's closer than anyone needs to be getting. But I thought Naruto's mind reeled. The events of the past month reframed under the lenses of barely averted natural disasters. Then that was why during the eczema the weirdness. All the looks. The realization that crossed Naruto's mind tasted like spit in hindsight. Like the pieces of a puzzle that hadn't just been laid out, but had been nearly put together for weeks, and he still hadn't seen the full picture. For a moment, he wondered about what other things he had missed when he. Naruto's heart pounded. Sasuke. He exclaimed, Horatian kunai flashing into his hands. He doesn't know and he's fighting him. I've got to help. In a blink, Naruto's arm reeled back and prepared to chunk the kunai in the direction of the battlefield. His arm surged with wild and uncontrolled chakra as he leaned forward, but was frozen with a smack as Jiraiya's hand clasped the blonde's bicep mid-throw. What the hell are you doing? Jiraiya hissed, narrowed eyes and clenched teeth. Going to save that idiot. Naruto shot back in reply, as though it was the most obvious answer in the world. He's fighting and he doesn't know that he's fighting a jinch cricky. Let you go? Jiraiya repeated, as though it was the most idiotic answer in the world. Let you go to do what? Sprint blindly into battle against a deranged Jinch Kriki, while an invasion begins from an unknown force. Gureya's grip on Naruto's arm tightened, and he physically lifted his student off the ground. If you want to do something that could get you and your friends killed, you just came up with a great plan. Jiraiya's grip was iron. Naruto twisted himself with grunts of defiance. Or, if you want to remember what I've been telling you all month and calm down, we can do something that can actually be helpful. Naruto squirmed, fury and panic writhing through his nerves like lightning. Jiraiya's grip was stronger. Seconds passed, and the blonde's hand loosened, kunai clattering to the stone below. His eyes, however, remained sharp as any blade. I have to save them. He growled. He wasn't pulling against his teacher's grip, but the flare and the blonde's teeth looked looked like fangs. I will save them. Jiraiya released, and Naruto leapt back, rolling his shoulder. The boy rounded on his teacher expecting some kind of smirk or mockery, but the Sanin's gaze caught him off guard. Most of the time, the paint on Jiraiya's face looked like a kabuki character. When Naruto had first asked, the pervert had insisted it was war paint. Naruto had fallen over himself laughing. As the Sanin stood amidst the rising pillars of smoke and flame, Naruto had a different opinion. It looked a lot like war paint, now. He swallowed. What should we do? Save everyone. Jiraiya's answer was immediate. Naruto felt the words rattle his bones. A spark flaring like a matchstick. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to accomplish that by planning our moves and striking when the moment is right. Jiraiya took a step, bending low to grab the dropped kunai and extended it handle first to his student. I need you to trust me and do everything I tell you to. Jiraiya said, his voice lowered. I know how you've been with your team and with Kakashi, but you're with me now. You're my student and when we're on a mission you do everything I say, when I say, and how I say. The blonde hesitated, panic and worry and hope battling in a storm across his features. 
Jurea's frame seemed to tower, white hair blowing in the wind enough to block the horizon from view. You do that, Naruto. The sage's voice dropped, but to Naruto it seemed to boom through his ears. You do that and we save everyone. Naruto's hand hovered, twitching just short of accepting the blade. A kindle to a flame. You promise. Jurea's eyes didn't waver as he shook his head. We're ninja, kid. He replied. We don't promise things. We don't wish or hope or pray. Jurea pushed the blade forward, forcing the blonde's fingers to grip the handle, a vice. We plan. We execute. We don't fail. So long as there are those to protect, we will protect them. No prayers. No promises. It's how things are going to be. The flame into a wildfire. Naruto's knuckles flushed wide as they gripped so tightly around the Hiroshin kunai. What do you want me to do? Jurei almost smiled, but the sound of an explosion cut it into a stern but pleased nod. School starts now. Phase one of any fight is intelligence. It's the key to every battle and fighting without it is like fighting alone. Jurei's hand swept into the distance, the sound of cracking trees and fire jutsu erupting from south of the arena. We need to understand what we're up against. He said, crouching to the ground on a knee and encouraging Naruto to stand beside him. Tell me everything you know about the kid. Naruto's eyes crinkled as he followed his teacher's gaze to the rising plume of smoke in the distance. Sasuke. No, no. Jiraiya snapped, shaking his head. The jinch cricky. That was that word. The way it hit the air, like putting a searing iron to supple skin. Naruto's gaze darkened, and his eyes wandered back to the source of the pressure. Gara, He said. His name's Gara. He's from the Hidden Sand Village. How does he fight? He's got the sand and adjust mobs. Naruto answered, scrunching his face as he searched for the way to describe the ability. He doesn't jump or use hand signs or anything. He fought Bushy Brow's kid and put him in the hospital. Naruto swallowed. And I don't think he moved a muscle. The bloodline. Jiraiya concluded. Or something from the beast. Either way, unique to him. Whatever it is, it's powerful. It took down people in the forest like it was nothing. Naruto added. The forest of death was a scary enough endeavor, but Naruto could still hear the distant screams and rumble of sand that whispered through the trees. He shivered. Shaking off the memory of the forest, Naruto pushed memory of the preliminaries to his mind. I think he thinks it's basically invincible. When Bushy Brows actually managed to almost hit him, he looked really freaked out. Jiraiya tilted his head. Freaked out? Yeah. Naruto nodded. Like eyes went real crazy and his teammates got super upset. It was weird. If this information was valuable to Jiraiya, the sage didn't say. He just made a soft him to himself and turned to the battlefield for a moment. Did you ever talk to him? Naruto shook his head. Not really. He talked to Sasuke, but we didn't really speak. Damn. Jiraiya cursed. I wish we understood his mental state. He's lonely. Naruto answered, but his voice sounded it was coming from another room, another place. He's got two siblings, a brother and a sister, but I don't they like him. Well, not like I think they're just afraid of him. Jiraiya's eyes shifted, but he said nothing. Naruto continued. Ehe, no. He said. I think they care about him, they're just scared. They didn't look at him like other people look at him. Like people look at me. There was another explosion in the distance, but that didn't create the sinking feeling in Jiraiya's chest. I thought you said you didn't talk to him. Naruto turned and met his teacher's gaze with a long, even glance. I just know. Something rumbled in Jurea's gut and he felt his fingers clench into a fist. He exhaled and his hand released. If he's letting the beast out, that's a problem. Jurea said after some pause. He's not going to recognize anyone friends, foe, or family. I find it hard to believe his siblings would knowingly want that, if they're as you say. A second explosion, loud and on the far side of the city. A pillar of smoke erupted and the screech of a monstrous creature could be heard. The explosion was enough to rattle Naruto from his thoughts, and the boy found his knees shaking as he witnessed the destruction from on high. It's a two-pronged attack. Jiraiya's voice was almost foreign how business it was. Such an abrupt change from the usual humor that filled his lungs. Let the beast run wild as an invading army storms the gates. He cursed and spit, a deep anger seeping into his blood and fists. The finals were just a distraction. Jiraiya's voice was distant like the pillars of smoke. Ashy, too. Naruto's eyes swapped between his mentor and his village, and he wouldn't tell which looked more broken. Okay. Jiraiya said, inhaling deeply and shifting down to one knee. If it's a two-pronged attack, we meet with a two-pronged counter. Naruto nodded, crouching as his teacher sketched an outline of the city into the dirt at their feet. The chinch cricky. Gara. Jiraiya swallowed, but nodded. Right. Gara. He continued. If his seal is cracking, he's the most immediate threat to the village. Neutralizing him is critical. Naruto nodded in understanding as Jiraiya reached behind him and pulled out a single piece of paper. 
a dull tan sheet etched with webs and spirals of ink that glimmered in the sun. As Naruto accepted the paper, his hands tingled as a numbness wrapped his digits. What's this? He asked. It's a five-point chakra sealing matrix. Jiraiya explained. We need to get that seal planted somewhere on Gara's body arm, stomach, leg doesn't matter as long as the whole seal sticks. What's it going to do? Fifth degree chakra block. Jiraiya stated, hesitating at the concerted furrow of Naruto's brow. He clarified. It's going to block all his chakra biju or otherwise. Naruto blinked, and the paper felt like it weighed a lot more than the parchment in his hand. And you just have this on you? He questioned. Jiraiya gave a small smirk. The Ichibi isn't the Jinchikriki I was worried about using it on, but yes a ninja is always prepared. He answered. Naruto swallowed. The paper felt a lot heavier. So I come with you and help you put it on him. Naruto asked. Jiraiya shook his head. I'm giving you this paper because you're going to put it on him. Me? Naruto squeaked, sounding every bit the teenager he was. What do you mean I'm going to do it? You just said Gara was the biggest threat. I said most immediate threat. Not biggest threat. Jiraiya's eyes seemed to harden, a dark shadow stalking the air. Rogue Jinch Kriki don't mastermind invasions. Someone is here and commanding this force. You'll be handling Gara, and I'll be ending this at the source. Naruto opened his mouth, but the right word had dried. I'll be he stammered. Handling. You're not. Naruto. Jiraiya's voice cut the stammering, but the tremble down Naruto's fingers rattled the paper like the wind. You wanted to learn to be a real shinobi, and this is where it starts. I'm trusting you to get this done. Naruto's throat was sand. It felt suffocating. Jiraiya's hand reached out and clasped against his shoulders. A light squeeze, and the blonde felt air and strength rush back into his lungs. He nodded. Understood. Good. The sage shifted, rummaging through his pouch. Long and thin, a scroll etched in red emerged. It had an intricate red seal, lattice wrapped along the length with green handles. If you get in trouble and I mean life or death, you throw this seal on the ground and be sure it cracks. What is it? Naruto puzzled, eyes pouring across the object with a reverence. It felt out of place, ceremonial. Like something to be protected at all costs not thrown to the ground in a battle. I've never seen something like this. Jiraiya snorted. Yeah, well. I should hope not. His answer was half cocky, half sure. I'm not like any seal master you've ever seen. Were the situation not so dire, Jiraiya was sure the blonde would have some kind of retort or general sass. Naruto only nodded, fingers clenching the seal with a renewed tightness. So how do I get over there? Naruto said as he turned his attention back to a fresh explosion just outside the stadium. A wall of sand 20 meters tall materialized out of thin air, collapsing into the forest with a distant rumble. Next to him, Jiraiya's hands began moving in a blur of signs. You leave that to me. The sage answered. And just don't forget that I offered you this option to begin with. Huh? Naruto didn't even have time to be confused. A puff of smoke, a crash, and the mesa they sat on was shadowed in darkness. Naruto's knees wobbled, his unbalance turning into downright panic as a colossal webbed hand reached out from an explosion of smoke and wrapped itself around his body. Hey. What the Naruto squeaked, but Jiraiya's voice cut through his protest. Bunta. He bellowed. 230, 3600 meters out. Get him to that far clearing he'll land on his own. Right. Came a booming voice. What? Naruto squeaked, a mouse wrapped in an elephant's trunk. What the? But there was no answer for the blonde. With a grunt and a slight wind up, the giant webbed hand of Gamabunta, Chief Toad, flashed forward. A small blonde meteor hurtled to the distant battlefield. Who's the kid, Jiraiya? Gamabunta chuckled as Naruto's scream flittered out into the background noise. The Toad Sage said nothing, striding up his summon's arm and coming to a perched stance above the creature's brow. Long story. He replied. I'll tell you after. Cliff notes version as he's my new student. The massive Toad gave what amounted to a raised eyebrow. New student. Bunta appraised. Is he as good as the old one? Jiraiya pondered how to answer that question for a moment, but the grin on his face to thee as he responded. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. He chided. But we're off to a good start. Emma Bunta took in the reply with a small chuckle before settling back. In one motion, the blade on its back slipped from its sheath into the creature's webbed hands, the folded steel glistening in an otherworldly glow in the sunlight. Ready? Jiraiya gave a nod, sinking into a seated squat. His hands clasped, and a low hum began to shimmer around his person. His features shimmered and shifted as he fell still. Let's move. Once the battle was over, blades sheathed and wounds tended, Naruto resolved that he was going to murder Jiraiya. Heaving and woozy, the blonde shoved his body into a standing position from where he had tumbled 20 meters into a wooded clearing. One little known fact about the Hiroshin no Jutsu was the conservation of momentum. 
well, that part wasn't little no, but Naruto still wasn't really sure what the hell it was all about, and people probably didn't know it applied to the Hiroshin. So imagine you're moving, yeah. Jiraiya coached. Naruto nodded, that vacant and distant nod that made the hermit question himself and his purpose and everything. So you're moving fast. He continued, a little slower. And you use the Hiroshin. Where does all your speed go? Naruto blinked. Oh? He asked. Jiraiya's hands came to his face, and he arsed one palm left across the sky. Maybe gestures would work. You're going like this. He insisted, resisting the urge to feel insane. And then you jump. For dramatic effect, Jiraiya shimmered his fingers and moved his palm to a new spot above his head. And you wind up at your kunai in the air. Which way will you go? It was like watching a river push against the walls of a dam. Jiraiya knew there was thought there the kid had asked no fewer than three pertinent, albeit grammatically incorrect questions today. But watching that thought come out was taking more of his patience than he realized he had available. Maybe he had been living on his own for too long. You would go Jiraiya held his breath. Down? Other than down. Another pause. A long one. You'd go Naruto began, and Jiraiya let his fool's heart soar. The blonde tentatively inched his hand in the same direction Jiraiya's had waved. To the left. Jiraiya knew he picked a good apprentice. The blonde gave a low roll of his shoulder with a hiss, yanking a patch of briar thorns from across his chest. Naruto had averted his downward momentum by directing a well-timed kunai to a less flat-like trajectory, but that momentum had been conserved. For 20 meters. Sideways. He disappeared from the sky only to flash into the undergrowth. Through two bushes, three medium saplings, at least a dozen moderate rocks. His plummet turned a slingshot, culminating in the dull thud against a now cracked and scarred oak tree. He could already feel the bruise pooling against his skin. Assel. He cursed to himself, giving a sympathetic glance to a nearby branch hanging on by mere fibers. Sorry, plants. The forest was quiet in response, the usual chirps and buzz of wildlife run off by the occasional explosive boom that seemed to ripple around the areas. He couldn't see any sign of commotion beyond his own entry trail, but wisps of smoke that cut through the foliage painted a path south. He tried to steady his breathing from the jump, but his nerves were too electric to give any kind of relief. But far more stealth than he entered with, Naruto bolted down the trail of smoke and embers. He tried to keep his pace measured, cautious. He didn't know what kind of fight awaited, but slapping a ceiling tag on a biju felt like something easier with the element of surprise. He couldn't avoid the twist in his gut that grounded his mind every time he thought of Sasuke and Sakura. Naruto swallowed and doubled his pace. The forest faded into the background as the smell of smoke and fire grew. Trees if they could still be called that looked like broken splinters strewn about in an absolute hurricane of destruction. Lifting his feet, Naruto's head tilted. Sand. Naruto whispered, millions of grains shifting and sliding beneath his sandals. What in the? The tree line broke into a clearing like a war zone. Tree and rock and sand flotsam and jetsam in the whirlpool. A maelstrom of destruction. The surrounding area smoldered and cracked like an alien world. Naruto didn't really notice that all of that, though. His eyes were transfixed to the kaiju monstrosity at the eye of the storm. At least 30 meters tall and half as thick a shifting wall of sand and claws and malice. The creature was hunched yet hulking, its limbs collapsing and reforming in an audible flood of sand. What the fuck? Naruto whispered while the creature leaned back, letting loose a crippling howl. Bees. It boomed, which was wild to Naruto, because this thing could talk building-sized monsters were horrifying enough without an appreciable grasp of language. Free 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 I'm free. It howled in voice Naruto could only internalize as a sociopathic landslide. The titan raccoon raised both arms and let loose a belly full of air and animosity with an animalistic screech. Gonna crush gonna kill gonna crush gonna kill. Great. Naruto grit as he shuffled for balance against a nearby tree limb, as wind and sand whipped and swirled around the creature. Giant monsters who can also speak and are absolutely out of their mind insane. With a soft click, Naruto removed the five-point seal and rubbed his thumb in circles along the outer markings. Now, how in the hell do I get this onto Gaara if I can't even see him he asked, the sound of the storm so oppressive he couldn't hear his own thoughts unless he made them audible. Another roar from the creature, and Naruto had to curse and drop into a lower limb, an errant blast of air and sand, obliterating his pervious perch. Being this close to the cyclone was like being next to a blender. He could feel parts of his jacket beginning to flake off against the abrasion, little specks of orange flittering off to join the rest of the tornado. The creature howled. Three compressed beams of air ripped a crater through forest and into the nearby bedrock. Shit. Naruto cried, fleeing another hiding spot from collateral damage. Where the hell is Gara? The name left his lips, a new current of air rocketed through the canopy. Naruto flipped, body twisting against the force as he hit hard into an oak's upper boughs. That's not Gara. His mind reeled. That blast came from behind the. 
two cyclones, slicing and carving a path through the foliage, sent him hurtling to the forest floor. Naruto's hands flew into old habits, five cage bush and bursting to life. Without a word, they scatter against the wind and behind separate trees. Who the hell is firing those? All five yell in unison like a chorus of confused and angry orange blobs. I'm not trying to fight you. One of the clones gave a pained yelp, dissolving into smoke as a trio of razor-sharp blades impaled a nearby sapling. The blade slice cleaned through bark, wood, and bark again, enough force to punch holes clear through the clone. What the hell kind of ninja are you? A voice called back as the rattle of wood and blades fraught against a sandstorm. I mean, who the hell yells you're not trying to fight? Naruto's brow furrowed, a memory of an almost street brawl playing across his mind in the same voice. Puppet guy. Four clones call back. There's no response from the puppet, but a new scythe of compressed wind puffed another hidden clone out of existence by obliterating the tree it had hid behind. Penkuro, be silent. A feminine voice called, tone as dry as the sand surrounding them. Just kill him and we can get back to finding Baki. The duo resume, twisting and winding as Naruto's, dodged, ducked, dipped, dived, and dodged. The blonde threw no counter-attack, but the sand duo danced with a practiced precision. Against the howling maelstrom, the sound of puppet blades and fan gusts, sound muffled their destruction dwarfed by the walking cataclysm. The blood gushing from Naruto's hand and chest, however, proved the attacks packed their own punch. Wait. He called out amidst frantic dodging. Wait, can we talk? I'm seriously not here to fight you. The blonde Tamari, was it? Lingered on a nearby tree long enough for Naruto to see the scowl that crossed her features. Do you always talk this much? She shot back. Naruto tried to twist an answer, but was forced to dodge the surging heat from a puppet flamethrower. Kankuro launched himself behind his puppet, following the blonde as he darted to a lower branch. I think he does. The puppeteer added. He had a full monologue prepared for that Hyuga kid. Naruto hit the ground with a smack, and he was concerned his teeth were less attached to his gums than before. Will you just? The blonde growled, summoning a clone and whipping it full speed into the puppet following him. The clone burst apart as the puppet turned into a shredder, but Naruto was able to leap away covered by the smoke. Hey. I'm trying to help here. Help. Kankuro shot back, incredulous. Help what? We're invading you, you moron. I'm trying to help my friends. Naruto's panted against the exertion, but he swallowed and pushed on. And also maybe to help Gara. Old, Kankuro. Tamari's voice cut through the forest with the same intensity as her wind attacks, and the dull roar of sandstorm filled their ears. Her battle fan was large and opened and pointed at the tree Naruto was peeking out behind, but it wasn't moving. That was as close to a start as he could have hoped for. With his hands raised in his best attempt at a calming gesture, Naruto stepped out from his hiding place and faced the girl. Kankuro and his creepy ass puppet, Naruto noted, followed behind his sister, his face a mix of warpent and concern. What do you mean, help Gara? Tamari demanded, eyes narrowing and grip tight on her fan. You mean to stop him? Naruto gulped, nodding. Yeah. He's out of control and he's going to hurt everyone and himself. There was something, concern. That flashed across Tamari's eyes, but it was buried as fast as it had appeared. Her grip tightened around he fan as her feet slid into their next dance. You cannot stop Gara. She informed him, cold and calm and angry at things Naruto didn't understand. No one can stop Gara. Not even if they wanted to. Naruto's next breath was like a weight, but his hand slowly unclenched to reveal the exposed seal, flittering in the breeze like a banner. What if he said? What if I told you I could stop whatever's happening to his seal? Seal? Kenkuro's eyes flashed, and an explosion of wires and knives erupted through the clearing as mechanical and wooden arms encircled the blonde. How the fuck does a punk like you know about Gara's seal? He seethed. Naruto tried not to flinch as he felt a kunai press against the bottom part of his jaw. Up close, Kenkuro's warpent was dark and uneven, like ancient blood slicing across ancient warriors. It would have been more intimidating than Jurea's were it not for the red and hot panic swimming through Kankuro's eyes. Naruto tried that thing he'd been doing a lot lately and took a moment to breathe and think before he responded. That doesn't really matter. He could feel something wet on the kunai against his throat probably poison as it sung against his skin. But what does matter is that I want to fix the seal and get Gara the help he needs and I can't do it fighting you two at the same time. The blonde's answer hung in the air against the sandstorm and he could feel Kankuro's deliberation. The knife didn't recede, but Kankuro's head tilted with a mixture of frustration and desperation. Damari. The Kanachi shifted, leaping from her perch and landing only feet from the standoff. Her eyes narrowed as sharp as the kunai against Naruto's throat. Why? She demanded, another step towards the blonde. Give us one reason to believe a genin, an enemy ninja, would have the intent, much less the ability, to save Gara. Naruto breathed out and felt a rush of relief he wasn't punctured. 
I think we both have an interest in the homicidal sand monster not running wild through the village. He countered. I saw Asuna Shinobi caught in those wind blasts it's giving off, and I bet your master plan doesn't involve exploding your own ninja. The Mari didn't respond. Naruto continued. And as for Gara, he continued, waving his hand as it slowly inched towards the seams of his jacket. Slow and metered, Naruto lifted his shirt. Dirt and cuts and rapidly healing bruises littered the blonde's torso, but the inky black swirl of the Kaiubi's seal was as dark as ever. A void tattoo, twisting and spiraling into the Uzumaki's abyss. The Mari's eyes widened, wide and full, while a strangled and horrified noise evaporated from Kankuro's throat. Almost independent of thought, they shuffled backwards. Away. I think Naruto finished, lowering his shirt. He and I might have a lot more in common than you might think. Yukankuro muttered, as much to himself as everyone around him. Yari didn't know Kanoha had. As he pulled his shirt back down and felt the wonderful feeling of not being held at knife point, the blonde gave a shrug. I mean, it's not like it's a really fun topic of conversation. Kankuro searched for words or rebuttals, but his voice felt like the sandstorm had taken even his thought. Helpless, he turned to Tamari. The Kanachi didn't speak, didn't even move her eyes remained glued to Naruto's own and the now hidden seal. Which one? She swallowed. Naruto tried to soften his posture, but there was a weight that wouldn't leave his eyes. Does it really matter? Outside them, the sandstorm raged. The Ichibi unleashed could be heard cackling, its laughter matching the snap of trees and earth and bone as it rampaged through the surrounding forest. Tamari caught a glimpse of a single, very corporal tail of sand slam into the earth, dust and forest launched into the sky. When she turned back to Naruto, there were tears welling in her eyes. These are brother. She said, every inch of warrior in her body fighting for courage. Our job was to be soldiers. To fight and die for the safety and love of Suna. Tamari pointed, her voice drenched with anger and betrayal so thick it felt like poison on her brother's blades. The eyes of her father, pit viper and hateful during the exams, echoed through her mind. We didn't ask to bodyguard our younger brother so that he could become someone else's monster. Naruto lowered his hand, still holding the five-point seal, but extending an open palm to the Kanachi. Then let's make a deal you two help me get this seal on Gara. We do that, then you guys go your own way and I go mine. No more killing or fighting or anything. The Mari's eyes lingered on Naruto, deciphering a million different explanations or possible reasons this one, stupid punk, would be making unsanctioned negotiations to ensure a non-lethal stop to Gara's destruction. Every inch of her training, Baki's hours of teaching and combat and war, screamed that this was a trap and she should gut him like a fish right where he stood. The Mari surged forward, clasping the blonde's hand in her own. Lie to us. She whispered, hot and heavy and hate-filled because she wasn't sure if hate or hope was more scary. And I bury you under all the sand and sun agakur. There were words in Naruto's head, almost refluxes. It's a promise. The promise of a lifetime. My ninja creed. Ureya's eyes filled his memory. A burning fire. We follow the plan. He said. We follow the plan and we save everyone. Damari leaned back and Kankuro lowered his strings and knives. So, kid. Kankuro offered. You got a plan. And a name. I don't remember it from the last time. Naruto snorted but gave a slow nod. It's Naruto. Yuzumaki Naruto. He answered, turning back towards the clearing. And yeah, I've got a plan. Arachimaru. The third Hokage's chest rattled, like trying to breathe through six feet of mud. Blood and pain thudded dull drums in his mind, and he could feel the stinging ache fissure down his bones. While his body had gone old and frail, his wayward student had lost nothing. Arachimaru's attacks were always pointed and powerful, precise and destructive. Hiruzen coughed, and a splattering of blood and dirt and tissue erupted. He didn't remember his student strikes being filled with this much distilled hate. You don't look well, master. The Kazakiage revealed traitor hissed. Gold eyes and pale features stared back. Malice and loathing filled the space. This job might be the death of you. Three punches and a sweep. Parry, block, parry, shit. Hirachimaru's knee made contact with the Hokage's forearm and a blinding pain shot up the limb. Hiruzen leaped, non-injured hand flying through seals as a torrent of mud erupted from his mouth. Arachimaru swerved, avoiding the flood and tossing a flurry of kunai in response. Why? Hiruzen barked, drawing his own kunai and deflecting the assault. Attacking Kanoha. Attacking your home. A flash of fury glimmered in his pupil's eyes, and the next kick sent shockwaves through the surrounding area as it made contact. The Sandin's breathing quickened, and a blade shimmered into existence. Home? The snake roared. Hiruzen could dodge four of seven swipes, his armor claiming another two. The final, unclaimed and unblocked, caught the inside of his thigh, ripping open in a mist of blood and pain. Home, he says. Come now, sensei. He taunted between swipes. Even you're not fool enough to think I there's love list between the leaf and I. 
Another flurry, blurred strikes and parries. Orochimaru hissed as a reverse elbow crunches into his gut, the snake slamming into the earth with a thunderous crack. Pirazin was old not dead. The cage heaved as a non-pulsed Orochimaru rose in the crater, idly swiping at a bloody lip. My my. Orochimaru hummed, brushing the rubble and roofing from his shoulder as he strode back into range. More spryness. Or just an old man's dying gasps. Pirazin's scowl only depended as he set into a low stance. If attacking me alone is your entire plan, the cage growled, then it seems your arrogance has only grown in time. Orochimaru snarled, a wicked and slighting tongue arsing across his teeth. I admit, there was a part of me that hoped for the chance to just cut your throat and bleed you dry with my own hands when I woke this morning. Painted lips stretched into a grin that sucked life from the air. The sandin made a pose, a hand raised in mockery. Fighting for glory is for fools and samurai. Ninja fight dirty, don't they, sensei? using any tool at their disposal to achieve mission success. The words were dark and hollow, and it made the Hokage's bones ache. Orochimaru wore a Cheshire grin, fingers tracing around his blade with a languid relish. And you thought I didn't pay attention to your lessons. There was a spike, a sudden thrust as the Sanin's katana embedded itself into the first. The snake's now free hands blurred. Seal after seal, an avalanche of chakra exploding from his body in visible shimmers. Three final signs, and a hand slammed into the ground. Ito Tensei. The roof quaked as the ground beneath Orochimaru's hand seemed to shimmer and melt. A single coffin rose from the seals as chakra scorched and simmered in the air. I hope you'll forgive me, master. Orochimaru's voice called out like rolling thunder. I had planned for this battle to be a reunion for you, but after the excitement today, I just couldn't pass on a poetic ending. The coffin creaked and shuddered, splitters of wood buckling beneath the flood of chakra in the air. Etched into the wood, the number four reflected in the horror of Hiruzen's eyes. Orochimaru only grinned. There may be new blood on the field, but I wonder how the original Yellow Flash will take to his successor. I don't own Naruto, but it means a lot to me. To put it mildly, the situation was deteriorating. Naruto, Tamari, and Kankuro stood at the edge of what could only be described as a new desert trees and wind swirled, a near constant stream of sand pouring from the surrounding area and burrowing itself into the creature as it howled. The creature was well over 50 meters tall, now, and growing fast. And you're absolutely sure of this plan. Kankuro's neck craned back, a mixture of fear and awe washing over his nerves like rain. Next to him, Naruto ran his thumb up and down the seal. Oh yeah. He lied. Just gotta get it done. Smack seal, save the city, get some ramen. Damari turned back and tilted her head, appraising the leaf genin with a glance that conveyed neither support nor doubt. You are not what I expected, Yuzumaki. She said. Naruto grinned and positioned a Hiroshin kunai between his teeth. Most unpredictable ninja in history, my old academy teacher used to call me. He offered. Guess some things don't change. The creature roared, taking particular offense to a large group of boulders and grinding them to dust with a concentrated blast of air. Naruto turned to his impromptu team. Ready? He asked. The duo nodded, and Tamari said into a low stance while Kankuro began flying through hand seals. When this is over, you owe me a new puppet, Yuzumaki. The black-haired puppet Kankuro had wrapped to his back bulged, its wooden parts turning in on themselves as the puppet folded and contorted. As Kankuro summoned more than two dozen kunai and swords and spears, the weapons were pulled to ports on the puppet-like magnets. At the sight of each weapon, Naruto could spot the flitter of an explosive tag wrapped with wire and recklessness. You didn't use this during the exam? Naruto wondered. Kankuro snorted. Large-scale explosions have been banned in the Chunin exams since the last exams in Iowa. Kankuro rolled his shoulders as he unwound strings of tags. But, we weren't exactly coming prepared to follow the rules of the Chunin exams. As he finished the final wrapping, Kankuro's hand lingered on the wood of his puppet's chest. Sorry about this, Karasu. He tilted his head, his voice dropped with something distant that Naruto didn't understand, but made him sad. When he turned back to Naruto, the blonde could have sworn he saw the tiniest smudge beneath the paint on his eyes. Listen, blondie. You'd better have its attention before I try. This move takes two months to get armed, and you only get one shot. Naruto managed a smile, making sure he used his eyes. If he'd have seen it, maybe Kakashi would have finally been proud of him. Don't miss your chance to blow, face paint. He offered, voice sounding more positive than he felt inside. If Kankuro had a retort, Naruto wasn't paying attention to hear it as he clasped his hands in the familiar cross of cage bushin. Two dozen Naruto sprung to existence, bounding out of the trees and rocketing to the clearing. The wind was a hurricane and the sand a crater. Each clone gave a scowl as four of their brethren popped out of existence, met with the same fate as a food put in a blender. Hey, you big fucking raccoon. The Naruto's yelled, as uneloquent as ever. He never had been any good with honorifics, and Aruka hadn't covered speaking to tailed beasts 101 in class. 
Why don't you turn around and pick on someone your own size? The sandstorm pause paused, not receded out of what appeared sheer disbelief. Like a mountain craning its neck, the Ichibi twisted its body, and two, black and gold starred eyes stared at the small army of orange genin running towards it. Is that an ant? It boomed. Did an ant just have the audacity to speak in my presence? Naruto didn't answer, opting to throw a small flurry of shuriken at the beast. The metal stars sunk with dull thunks, crashing into the sand body of the creature and being absorbed into its mass. The Ichibi, for its part, howled. Yahahaha <laughs> incredible. Its laughs rippled in the air, and another six clones were blown from existence. I sit locked in this pathetic child for years, and now I face more children. Are the sons of men all that remain of mortals? You're the one taking over people's bodies. The remaining Naruto's retorted as two more were swallowed in coffins of sand. Let Gar go. It was hard to tell if the creature was laughing or screaming with rage, any noise coming from its mouth made Naruto's ears want to split. Pun enough, little ant. The taunt he heard, but his mind could only focus on the tsunami of sand stretching out to wrap his clones. But I am in no mood for games. Clone after cone, pop after pop. The Ichibi sand didn't as much strike or attack, it consumed. Any of the Naruto clones running on pure sand are swallowed with a crunch of earth and forest. Naruto's are laid to waste in another five attacks until a single blonde-haired ninja is wrapped, trapped by insurmountable pressure, as Naruto was raised like a rag doll to eye level with a beast. I will give you one thing, human. The Ichibi hissed, teeth and sand churning in the creature's maw. Up close, Naruto was able to get a full dose of the crazy, and it felt like taking a shot of lighter fluid and jumping into a volcano. You are as amusing as you are suicidal. The sand surrounding Naruto crunched, and Naruto could feel coffin walls closing in as sand ascended to encircle his head. His vision blurred with little spots of darkness growing. The Ichibi crackled with malice and madness. Any last words, insect? Yeah. Naruto rasped, each breath bringing a stream of sand sliding down his throat. Didn't anyone ever tell you not to play with your food? There's a poof. The last Naruto clone popped out of existence in the prison of sand. Rage and fury and raw chakra explode from the creature as its eyes darted the nearby battlefield. Insect. The Ichibi screeches. When I find you, I'll tear you limb from limb. I'll flay your body and rip your brains out and feed them to everyone you know and love and. Hey Shukaku. A new voice, Kankuro's, erupted from the forest. Let go of my brother you douch. The cool factor, or lack thereof, of calling a Biju's avatar a douch, was something that Naruto wouldn't let Kankuro live down for decades to come. Regardless, the immediate effect is achieved. The creature's blinding fury exposed its face to the tree line, and a black-haired missile exploded like a catapult towards the creature's face. Caruso rattled, skeleton bones of wood, as it arsed through the sky. The wisps of blue chakra wires severed as the puppet left controllable range and entered a free fall toward Shukaku. A defensive wall of sand erupted out from the creature's face, but the real danger was in the hands of a young Tsunagenin, as he held his hands into a familiar yet enormously fun seal. Hi. A blossom of fire and heat erupted, the dozens of explosive tags strapped to the puppet igniting like fireworks. The Ichibi shrieked, shaking the earth as its lumbering body staggered. From the nearby trees, Tamari's eyes narrowed like a hawk through the forest. The Ichibi's face crumbled, sand either blown off its visage or slags of molten glass from the heat of the fire. Through the falling sand, Tamari's hands whitened on the hilt of her fan as a tuft of red hair emerged from the creature. Naruto. She cried. Now. In a flash of yellow and orange, Naruto zapped from existence, reappearing crouched with his final Hiroshin kunai flipped in his hands. Do it. Tamari growled, channeling chakra and every ounce of muscle in her arms into swinging. The wood of the fan groaned, and Naruto could feel a brutal snap as the arm shattered just moments after the force and a burst of wind sent him, for the second time today, rocketing into the sky. The wind howled, but Naruto's heart felt silence. Hey Gara. Naruto's bravado and adrenaline moving his tongue more than his mind. Time to wake the fuck up. Naruto's voice was a whisper in an avalanche, but the Ichibi's fractured and broken and rapidly reforming face still turned. The creature lacked eyes, but its chakra hit Naruto like a tidal wave. Kill. 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 Even without a mouth, the creature's lust for carnage and destruction felt like a physical wall. His body reached the top of the arc, but his throat was closing. The ground looked so far and the Ichibi so tall and Naruto could feel his courage and breath and grip leaving him. The Ichibi's madness gripped his body like a rag doll. What was he doing? Why was he up here? What the hell was he thinking and why would he? It was thunder. A crimson heat burst inside his navel, swirling and burning, and something snarled. The Ichibi's pressure, so looming and crushing, dissipated and didn't just stop it fled. Naruto's vision blurred red, his muscles pulsing under a strength beyond his own, as his eyes honed in on the slumped form of Gara of the Sand. Hey, you shit. 
Naruto cried, his voice crackling the red chakra surging around his body. I said it was time to wake up. Naruto's arm sizzled, fabric and skin burning away under a cloak of crimson and maroon chakra. With a howl, Naruto surged forward and flung his final Hiroshin kunai like a missile. A sand wall rose to block the projectile, but the red chakra etched into the weapon, burst through the barricade with prejudice. The dagger made its own mini-explosion as it lodged itself into the sand directly next to the unconscious genin. Naruto flickered, and a blinding flash of red and yellow filled the skies. Before sand could react, Naruto reappeared next to Gara and slammed the five-point seal directly onto the genin's forehead. Gara screamed, eyes flying wide. The scream was a wail, anger and rage and promise of future retribution coded in the Ichibi's essence, but faltered and dissolved into nothing more than the nightmare-fueled cries of a scared child. The colossal sand body of the Ichibi's avatar shifted, the source of its structure gone, and the tower of sand falling aimlessly to the forest floor. Naruto, heaved, stomach churning and muscles fried. He tumbled, clinging to a barely conscious and stunned Gara. Neither had the energy to scream as they slid down a collapsing mountain of sand. Sand was a shitty cushion. The afterburner still racked through his veins, but sand and bruises and pain covered every inch of Naruto's body as he and Gara came to rest on the ground. Holy shit. He hissed, a rush of fresh pain mixing with vacuum left after the red chakra twisted and burrowed back behind his navel. I am never, ever getting in the air, again. Naruto forced his body to a semi-risen position, his eyes turning to the still-shaking red-haired genin beside him. Hey. Naruto said, whipping his leg a little to nudge Gara's arm. You alright. The contact sent Gara into a frozen panic, the boy scrambling and flailing as he looked, desperate to the sea of sand surrounding them. Shukaku. Gara rasped, his voice broken and distant. Wide bloodshot eyes outlined by deep and heavy circles met Naruto's own, and it was hard to believe this was the same stare that had crippled Lee. But the boy continued. A tiny raccoon, lost and shaking in the middle of a desert storm. Where is Shukaku? I can't hear it I can't. Gara. Both Naruto and Gara turned to the voice, Tamari and Kankuro slid down the newly formed dunes to stop meters from the two. Gara shuffled, his arms and legs pulling him back as his eyes met his siblings. For their part, Kankuro and Tamari seemed just as lost. Gara. Tamari was the first to extend, first to reach out. Maybe it was the older sister in her, but the desperate claw in her mind to stay away nodded her throat. For the first time in her whole life, she felt like she could see Gara's eyes. Tamari. His voice wavered and the world seemed to spin. Kankuro. Tamari said nothing, but her heart made its own decisions. One step at a time, she approached. Each step pressing into sand, her mind calculated the thousands of ways for Gara's all-present, ever-consuming protection to grab her. Pull her down and just keep pulling until everything was dark and she was breathing dirt. Another step forward, the sand never moved. The Mari Kankuro warned, but it was half-hearted and distant. His mind felt the same pull, the same hesitation, but he was always the cautious one. He didn't start moving until Tamari had collapsed to her knees in the sand, just outside Gara's reach. Her hand reached out, and it occurred to her this was the closest to Gara she had ever been. Gara. She whispered. Her hand was so close. When her skin finally met the boy's face, his body went stiff at the touch. Tamari held up another hand, cupping the opposite side of Gara's face as he stared, frozen in shock. Gara. She whispered, words turning into tears turning into total collapse of her everything. Gara. 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 She repeated his name like it was the first time she'd ever said it, and by the time Kankuro made it to the two he's crying as well. Both sets of arms wrap around Gara's frame, and the boy can do nothing but stare and shake. We thought Kankuro sobbed. We thought you were gone. Tamari said nothing, repeating her brother's name as her arms wrap around his frame. From beside the scene, Naruto gave a hacking cough. Gentle hugs. He suggested, his own ribs seeming to experience the pain through pure proximity. That fall hurt like hell. The blonde's comments were ignored, but Gar recovered enough from the exhaustion and shock to mumble a question. What he began. Has happened. The words, even saying them, left Gar breathless. His whole life, every moment and every waking hell, spent alongside the howling and wailing of a half-captured monster. Whispering and screaming and threatening to kill any and everything he ever loved if he fell asleep. It was constant. It was all-consuming. It was it was. It's gone. Gara said. The silence in his mind left a booming echo that shook his soul. I can't hear it. Damari reeled, face a cascade of hope and relief and tears. You're here. She whispered. Gara could barely process. It was gone. It was gone and his sister who he had never held in his life was wrapped around him like he'd collapse into sand if she let go, and saying that he was here. My existence Gara shook. My existence was buried by Shukaku. Kankuro gave a racking cough, shaking his head so hard his hood fell back and buried his head into his brother's. 
Not buried, Gara. You're safe, now. Safe. Did he even know what that word meant? There was a moment of quiet and still, an image of two arms and a brown-haired woman wrapped around Gara's body. Safe. He buried his head forward, and the sand parted. By the time Gara tilted his head to gaze to the left, Naruto had risen to his feet and was shakily standing. How? He asked. Naruto wheezed, giving a mild shrug and trying to be cool, but the wheeze turned into a hacking cough of blood and sand. It's a really long story, dude. He said. It was both the truth and he felt like he had a bruised rib and it hurt to say anything. I cut a deal with your brother and sister. Once I find my sensei we can talk he knows how to make what I did permanent. Ara said nothing, but his head nodded as though any of this made sense at all. Tamari turned her head, eyes red with tears and refusing to let go of her brother. Thank you. She whispered. Naruto smirked, but it reached well beyond his eyes and spread a warmth even through his aching bones. We followed the plan. He smiled, but a memory pulled at the line on his lips. Turning to Gara, he took a rattled step forward. I know this is a lot for you all. He said to the trio. No sand left to attack him, but Gara's blank and confused gaze left Naruto anxious, unable to read the meaning. But I need to find my team. Pink hair and blue shirt. Do you know where they are? Looking more pointedly at the still shell-shocked inch cricky, Naruto gulped. He was supposed to be your opponent. Gara blinked, shaking his head. I never fought. He answered. Naruto's concern morphed to confusion. Never fought. Disqualified. Kankuro added between trying to find his voice again. The Achiha showed late and the attack started early. There was a race of emotions crossing Naruto's face, but chief among them were that Sasuke hadn't fought the literal demon, and that meant he and Sakura were somewhere back at the stadium. You didn't fight. Naruto repeated, excitement and hope parsing like lightning through his voice. Then, I still have time. He wasn't too late. They hadn't fought Gara and it wasn't too late, and he could still do something. Now all he had to do was get back to the stadium and find them. If he could just muster the strength to. It was like a gong. Like a silent gong ringing throughout the. The hairs on Naruto's back surged, a single pulse echoing through his mind. What he whispered, turning from the sand trio and gazing back to the city. He could feel it, like a single needle pushed into the back. A signal. A beacon. A call. A Hiroshin. It wasn't something Naruto could describe, and Jiraiya had told him to just stop trying, but when the Hiroshin seal was active and within range, Naruto could feel it. Like closing your eyes and walking through the house he'd lived in his entire life. He knew exactly where the pulse was coming from and could feel it calling out, ready to receive. There was only one problem. Naruto looked down into the nearby sand, the only shimmer being the hilt of his last Hiroshin kunai, lying in the sand only meters away. This wasn't right. Naruto picked up the blade, ignoring the burning pain in his movement. He could feel the call. Far away. Up high. Not here. Ureya. He wondered, but the pulse didn't respond. It just hummed, like a ring in the back of his head only he could hear. It had to be Jiraiya, calling him or checking on him. Maybe he had found Sasuke and Sakura. Maybe all of this was over and he could just go to Ichiraku and relax. The pulse hit him again, and his gut twisted. This was wrong. Something was. There was a blinding yellow flash, and Naruto was gone. He wasn't flying through the air, but Naruto didn't land on his feet when he reappeared. Pain and impact, blood, blonde, and orange skidded into existence against a semi-collapsed roof. Tiles shattered and clattered like glass as the blonde rolled, only just digging a hand into the tile to slow his roll before he reached the edge. Naruto's eyes flared open to look around only to see. Purple. The words left his mouth and something pulled. A coil of rope that slithered bound his ankles and arms before he could process what was happening. What the hell? Naruto squirmed against a bond, but whatever was wrapping him felt like fighting steel. But the Naruto cried out as he was lifted, suspended in air by serpentine bonds. There was a blur, a white shimmer, and a figure appeared next to him as though from air. Well, well, well. The dark chill that sunk into his ears made his blood turn to stone. A fear, like an anchor tied to your foot and throwing it overboard, took hold. Naruto Uzumaki, in the flesh. Slitted eyes leered, piercing. The voice was like honey and poison. There was a pressure pushing down on him, a force. It wasn't the all-encompassing, raging storm that the Ichibi's presence had leveled. This one was smaller but so much more pointed. So much more focused. If Gara possessed was an avalanche, this was an icicle already pushed against your throat. Naruto felt like he'd forgotten how to breathe. When Kabuto shared that he had made the most interesting acquaintance before the exams, imagine my surprise when it turned out to be you. The words twisted in the air, like oil spilling through a placid lake. Naruto's mouth opened and closed, but only a crackle of dry air escaped. The black-haired ninja, like a twisted version of that stange attacker from the Forbidden Forest. Naruto rasped. Are you? 
The figure smiled like poison felt. Yellow slitted eyes and pale white skin. He continued without answering. The forest, of course. A taste of your rather curious abilities. The figure raised a single eyebrow. From the looks of it, you didn't care for my parting gift. The cackle. But then you arrive in the arena, and pale hands trace an elaborate path through air as the sand and bent, deftly swiping a three-pronged kunai from the ground. And now this. The man's laugh was dark and hollow, but filled with such a tangible hate it coiled like moisture in the air and stuck to Naruto's skin like sweat. Naruto watched as the man gripped the kunai. His hand paled, squeezing the metal knife so tight his fingers shook. Naruto couldn't even follow the hand's signs, but a stream of fire erupted from their mouth and engulfed the kunai. Steel and fabric glowed in the heat, wobbling and wavering and melting in a steaming puddle of molten metal to the ground. You can't possible know, Naruto-kun. The ninja was almost whimsical. Amused. A snake coiling around a mouse. How deep the water beneath your feet is. Arachimaru. Naruto's eyes flew open as a second figure shambled out of a nearby crater. Blood and black cloth draping off his body, Hiruzen Suratobi stumbled forward with a broken hand covering a hole in his lower torso. Get the hell away from him. Old man. Naruto's blood boiling from ice to fire and back. The Hokage's presence was so diminished, so broken, it was like nothing the boy had ever seen. With his lone free hand, the cage blasted through hand signs faster than Naruto had ever seen. Pillars of earth erupted from the roof, eruptions of mud and rock. With a speed Naruto could barely follow they blasted towards the snake Sanin. Orochimaru. The betrayer. Naruto hadn't been a good student, but stories of the Sanin were like comic books. He knew all the characters. All the heroes. All the villains. Orochimaru's body broke, twisting and contorting like a corpse as he dodged each projectile. The only thing Naruto could see was the smirk that never left the Sanin's face. Even on death's door, such ferocity, sensei. Orochimaru's hands flashed, and the ground near Hiruzen rumpled. But you're getting sloppy. The holes where the pillars of earth had erupted shimmered and expanded, a pool of mud and water coiling along the rooftop beneath the Hokage's feet. Hiruzen crouched to jump away, but Orochimaru was above him like a missile. A kick crashed into the Hokage's guard like a meteor, and the roof buckled under the strain. Steel and mud and debris exploded through the area as a crater formed two stories deep. Old man. Naruto cried, as helpless as before. Hiruzen was pinned, body pressed and bleeding beneath beams and rubble. From above the crater, Orochimaru gave a laugh. It felt like spit. Turning back to Naruto, the Sanin waved his hand, fingers trailing in the breeze. It felt like cold sandpaper against his skin as the prison squirmed, thousands of snakes moving in unison as the blonde was drugged closer to the crater. Naruto. The snake said, and Naruto hated the way his own name sounded. I'm actually so glad you could join us. Orochimaru's eyes turned to the crater, and Hiruzen squirmed beneath the rubble. There's someone that I'd like for you to meet. Don't do this. The cage rumbled. Pleading. Don't do this, Orochimaru. The snake Sanin didn't respond, only giving a vague wave as he pulled yet another Hiroshin kunai from his robes. Helmich eiled, Orochimaru twisted the blade between his fingers. A cold pounding, like drums and thunder and promises of pain, started echoing behind Naruto's ears. Have you ever wanted to meet the fourth Hokage? There was a blinding flash. Tattered white cloak swaying in the wind. The man before him crumbled and shifted, a constant state of decay and repair. His eyes were blank, hollow, but the tufts of blonde hair swaying across his brow was like looking in a mirror. Naruto's body shook. Orochimaru drank in the fear like wine. Uzumaki Naruto. Orochimaru bent, a mocking bow. I'd like you to meet the fourth Hokage. Naruto barely processed as the bonds around him loosened. His eyes were transfixed. His feet slid back to the floor with a slump, legs so numb it didn't even register. Orochimaru stepped behind the blonde, a slender hand sliding against Naruto's shoulders. Never met, and yet the apprentice gave a pointed glare to his bleeding, broken teacher. I think you might find you have so, so much in common. Naruto tried to run. To scream. Nothing. He couldn't take his eyes off the face, greeting lifeless eyes with a white-hot tremor. The man's lips didn't move, no indication of life. Yes, the resemblance is just uncanny, isn't it? Orochimaru was almost cackling. Like staring into a mirror. What a peculiar thing for two supposed strangers to favor so much. The wicked grin. Familiar in every sense of the word don't you think? The crumbling man shook. His foot inched, crept and shambled as his legs pushed forward. Naruto was frozen. In truth, it pains me to end this reunion. Orochimaru lamented. So many years missed, so much lost time. The Sandin's eyes rolled back to the Hokage as Hiruzen attempted to struggle to his feet. Another one of your secrets leading to a tragic outcome, Sensei. He hissed. How terribly fitting. Orochi Hiruzen wheezed. The cage's mind screamed and shouted for his arms to move, to do anything, but the nerves and bones fell silent. 
You can't do this. He doesn't deserve. Doesn't deserve. Arachimaru spat. The man's presence seemed to swell, arrogance and pride, giving way to a wave of hatred that flooded the clearing. You would presume to know what other people deserve, wouldn't you? The shambling man took another step. Naruto's body refused to move. Unblinking eyes stared into blue, and a decaying hand reached and wrapped itself around the genin's neck. But I'm afraid there's no time for more lessons, today. No sooner had the Sanin's rage appeared, it receded, the momentary lapse giving way to cold commands. The fourth Hokage. Namaka's Minato. Orochimaru's eyes flashed as he ordered. Fill your son. Recognition. Understanding. Confusion. Horror. Each passed through and left Naruto as immobile, as if his arms had been buried and dried in cement. The fourth Hokage's hand lunged, and Naruto didn't try and dodge. He couldn't move at all. All he could do was stare, transfixed, in the blue eyes of Namaka's Minato's features shuddered. His hand stopped a breath from Naruto's neck. Then the body choked, like speaking through drowning. Minato's grip neither loosened nor tightened, but his arm shook as the man fraught words on his lips. No. Naruto's throat went dry, the man's voice echoing through his mind. My, my. Hirachimaru cackled, raising an eyebrow in almost amusement. A will so strong, it defies me even in death. Naruto just stared. Minato's eyes didn't shift or his face change, but his hand continued to tremble. Orochimaru's eyes narrowed, a complex calculus flashing behind face as he witnessed the struggle. Now this is something truly unexpected. He said. His voice was clinical, the scientist within unable to overlook the anomaly. An Edo Tensei bond, even without a soul. Orochimaru approached the duo, eyeing the homage with a mixture of fascination and annoyance. This is quite unexpected. With a cold and calculated precision, Orochimaru's eyes roamed around the walking corpse. This shouldn't even be possible. The body is here, but your poor father's soul is still trapped in the belly of the death god. The scientist disappeared. The monster returned, scowling. Sickening. His eyes met Naruto's. You do know your father's in eternal torment, don't you? But the same callous apathy, the scientist returned. But the Shinigami isn't as picky on bodies, so I managed to make a deal to let just his body out. Orochimaru took a kunai, slowly pressing it into the side of the Hokage's skull. There was no blood, no flinch or even blink as the blade was buried in the man's skull. When he released the blade, it slid out of the gaping hole without a sound. Naruto watched, eyes wide as the wound shifted and ruffled like peeling paint. Not quite healing, but disappearing into shifting skin. And yet here his body stands, acting like it has a soul. Orochimaru made a low clicking sound and shook his head. That simply won't do. Naruto-kun. The snake called. It seems I must thank you again for this most fascinating new information. I never imagined such a reaction could occur, but clearly improvements are required. The mad sand enrolled his shoulders with a careless eye. But, alas, there just isn't time. He announced, taking a step forward and reaching across to his hip. I'll just kill you, burn Kanoha to the ground, and then I'll pull your fathers out of death for real and see what's going on. In a flourish, the kusanagi was drawn. Cold steel shimmered as it slid through the air, whined through clearings. The Sanin's arm shifted, and the blade raised above Naruto's head, pointing directly into his neck Naruto didn't even notice. All he could do was stare into the eyes before him as the stared, empty, back. Goodbye Yuzumaki Naruto. Boom. An explosion, deep and raw and loud swept through the clearing. The Sanin's blade steadied as his eyes snapped to the left. The purple of the barrier shimmered, a prismatic rainbow as it shuddered at the blow. Again. Boom. This time, Arachimaru shifted. Flowing like a wave, his stance turned to face a single point in the barrier wall. A crack, hairline and stretching had erupted from the light. Boom. Kid. It was only the combo, a voice and a thunder that snapped Naruto's attention from the body trapping him. Hiro Senen. He rasped. His hands clawed up and into the hand around his neck. Naruto pulled at the grip, but it was like scraping at a steel chain. The scroll. Jurei roared, glowing with a chakra aura Naruto had never seen before, as he slammed another fist into the barrier. It was like the trees were everything. Like every strike Jiraiya levied at the wall had the weight of the forest itself. The resounding gong shook the field, and Orochimaru surged towards the weakening border. Two birds he snarled as the snake prepared to fight the new intrusion. Use the scroll, Naruto. Nah. The blonde's body went still, his eyes shifting like sand to the voice. Nah the animated body of the fourth Hokage whispered. His voice was lost. So lost but so desperate to find. Naruto. The scroll tumbled, slipping through the genin's fingers and clattered to the ground. There was an eruption of smoke, like a firecracker, and a massive blob of hair. Razor-sharp spines of hair punctured the husk of the fourth hokage, with so much force his body was sent flying into the nearby buildings. Naruto collapsed, gasping at the sudden return of air to his lungs. You alright? 
Jiraiya's voice asked, but Naruto was too busy heaving into the dirt. He raised a weary look, exhaustion. Confusion. Pain. Jiraiya's lips hardened to a single line. We'll talk more later. The man said, but Naruto's vision was starting to blur. The sudden rush of oxygen and movement. The world started shifting, fading in and out of color. Sensei his voice a whisper. Was that my? But the question never came. Naruto's vision blurred, and his body collapsed in its next step. If anyone is concerned about the rules to Ito Tensei, please know that I do understand how the soul bit works in the manga. I just think this is an interesting change, so bear with me and we'll learn more about these rules next chapter. Really felt it had some cool implications this way for a lot of characters. What if Naruto trained by summons for Chunin exams, and thanks for watching my video till the end. If you enjoy this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel, and leave a like if you guys need the next part, comment down, and thanks for watching the video and see you guys in the next video.